at you and tell you to bring the microphone closer. All right. Sounds good. That's <clears throat> player introduction, and then we'll go. Welcome to the Big Honker Podcast, brought to you by Gun Dog Outdoors. I'm Jeff Stanfield with the world famous Andy Shaver. That's right. Excited about this one. Got my old high school coach in here. And tell everybody how great I actually was. How hard of a worker I was. Absolutely. That's right. That's your one word answer. Is absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's no. that's that's the. Are you what, nervous? There's a lot of things. Not too bad. Good. There's a like Zach. Zach was a great athlete, but I would outwork him, and I take that as a bigger uh, badge of honor than just being a good athlete. Well, nobody said you was a good athlete. I know. Okay. But I I, I yeah. pride myself in being a hard worker. It's funny. Andy's coaching. Wayne, he's nervous as shit over Don't there. Don't be nervous. There's nothing to be nervous <laughs> about. Jesus. We, uh, we, Andy was coaching Little League the other night, and <laughs> this poor kid catches for Andy, and he was not enjoying catching. He was not having a good time Everybody wants to be a catcher in Little League baseball because you get to wear the gear, and then you get to be a catcher, and it's not fun. You're squatting down. It's hot. Yeah, after about five innings, they're they're about done. And this little yeah. boy—that's really the hardest position playing baseball, in my opinion. Yeah. This this boy was not having it. He was upset, not liking it, and basically, you just have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Andy let him know he was a catcher all through little league, and I, Andy goes, "I played in hard. high school too." He goes, "I worked hard, and I work hard. I'm a lot of things, but I'm not lazy." So he got that work ethic from you. Yeah, that well, you know, Andy played quarterback, and anytime you put anybody, anytime you put a guy. At quarterback, you want him to be smart, and you want him to be a leader, and you want him, you know, to work hard. And Andy definitely was that for sure. Did you see what He's Dion recently? Did you see what Dion recently said? <clears throat> Dion Sanders. He said, "I want my quarterbacks to come from a two parent two parent home. I want them to be smart, have about a three point five to four point oh um, offensive lineman, same type. I want them to be smart, two parent home." He said, "D lineman, totally opposite." He said, I want somebody from Section 8 housing fighting for mama. Dumb as a box of rocks, just that has to make it. They came after him for that. <clears throat> really? They were not yeah. happy hmm. because he was kind of classifying. As a retired coach, do you agree certain... with him on that? Well, <clears throat> you know, obviously you want you, you, you want your best people, you know, on the offensive line. Right. You want some guys that are smart because that's where it, it all happens. You want your best athlete at quarterback because he's going to touch the ball more than anybody else. But, yeah, those D linemen, they got to be a little bit nasty because those <laughs> are the guys that are getting hit every every play. They have to make sure they keep people off of those linebackers. Yeah. And they have to make tackles and get the pass rush. So, yeah, they've got to be – they they got to be tough. They he get, took some heat, but I agree with what he <clears> said. <throat> and, I mean, here's the thing. The black people got mad at him. Well, here's the thing. It's what happened. And especially, like, at Dion's level – at the college level, you're looking at an entire nation and you have to have a certain criteria that you're going to look at players by. Otherwise you're just kind of pissing in the wind because you're going to, you're not going to be efficient because you're having to look at everybody. But if you're like, this is what we tend to look for, for a quarterback or a D lineman, you kind of have a place to start. So I don't understand why I do understand why, but I don't agree with why he got villainized for it. Well, look at, look at the quarterbacks yeah. in the NFL. Just go up with quarterbacks, Russell Wilson, Two parent home. Jalen Hurts, two parent home. Whose dad's a coach in Texas? I didn't realize that. Yeah, his dad's at Houston. He's a high school coach, dead in Houston. Two parent homes. Those those are two. Uh, Patrick Mahomes, two parent home. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can go down the disc. You don't find very many kids coming from unstable family. They're quarterbacks. I'm sure there are some, but there's not a lot of them. I bet you, if you look on the defensive line and you look at some of them studs playing on the other side, probably most of them. I don't know where Aaron Donald come from, but that's a bad mofo right there. So wherever he come from, he got some dog in him. Now I'll talk about your life for a little bit. <laughs> All right, you, were, I had a great time. I was so blessed in my lifetime with getting married to Michelle and the boys and getting to be around you guys 
is I got to be around you guys I really liked and Coach Steele. And you and Coach Steele are two of my best buddies in the world, and I loved having you, what y'all did for my kids. But you're the All-American boy. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to I'm gonna give everybody a background check on that. Wayne, he grew up in Knox City, Texas. Was an underdog basically when y'all won state, right? Yes. Weren't y'all, y'all weren't to supposed to win? Bremon was supposed to beat no. y'all's lips off, weren't they? Yes. And they were beating y'all's ass at halftime, wasn't they? 20, 20 to 6, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> and didn't you take it to the house on them? Right before half. You took it to right before half? We, that- we were actually getting beat 20 to nothing, I think, after the first quarter. I mean, it, it they were blowing us out. We didn't have any business being on the field with those guys because they were so athletic. Offensive line, defensive line, I mean, they were loaded. But, you know, our group, we <clears throat> we were just – I don't know. We we had some really smart offensive linemen, a uh, little bit of outlaws in them, and look, they they just you know really fought really hard, and we had that never give up attitude, and we had that Knox City attitude. You know, I have friends that come back. Y'all just have that Knox City attitude. I'm like, well, what is that? Well, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I guess we just thought we were going to win. It didn't matter what we competed at. We just felt like we were going to win. I I still remember in junior high. We were headed to Quana, and Quana was loaded in junior high. This is our eighth grade season. We're headed to to Quana, and I remember on that bus ride, a bunch of us were in the back. We were listening to Queen. <laughs> we are the champions, <laughs> and we said, like one of these days, when we get in high school, we're going to win state. And you know, in reality, that that probably wasn't going to happen. But we talked about it You're as right. eighth graders. Yeah. And then that group of kids I, in my class, we just kind of stayed together the whole time and you know our junior year we we make it to the semifinals and get beat and then you know nobody expected us to come back our senior year and and go win state but but we did so we that y'all were getting down y'all were beating <clears throat> 20 to nothing right before and, half, nothing. and you scored right before half was right that kind of half. a shot in the arm that y'all needed to uh, carry it was def- momentum it was definitely definitely a boost um i can still remember the play we had ran so, so we were. I didn't even play quarterback till I was a senior in high school. Mm-hmm. As a junior, I was a tight end. Uh, Dwayne Watkins was our quarterback uh, our junior year. He tore his ACL. He he couldn't make it back for our senior year. So I, they threw me uh, in at quarterback, and so we ran the veer. I wasn't what you call a great passer. I mean, I could throw the ball and I could you know complete the pass and everything. But we were a, we were a running team. We were a split back veer. And I can still remember we didn't actually read the veer. Coach Sloan would either call twelve veer keep, thirteen veer keep, or twelve veer give, or thirteen veer give. And then if I kept it, I had the option of pitching it. Mm-hmm. So we ran thirteen veer give, and I gave it. And I'm sitting there looking at that defensive end, thinking, "Man, if I would have just kept that, I could have scored." So I was like, "Man, I hope he calls thirteen veer keep in the next play." <laughs> and sure enough, here comes thirteen veer keep. So I knew before, you know, the ball was even snapped that I was fixing to keep the keep the ball. So I'd ride it a little extra longer, you know, on on the veer, and and I pulled it, stuck my foot in the ground. I don't know, made a couple of moves, and then I'm in the, you know, secondary, and just happened to outrun them to the end zone. I think it was that's about a humble s- man happened to outrun <laughs> happened them. Just happened to be the fastest guy. I on think the field it, I think uh, it was about <clears throat> six. I think it was sixty yards, something like that. <laughs> And that's what changed the game. Then the second half. Did y'all get the ball at halftime or second half? I can't remember. I just know we're jogging in at at halftime. And I remember Kevin Eaton saying something, man, we're going to win this game. They're going to have to kill me before, you know, we lose this game. And mm-hmm. then a couple of other guys, it was probably Chris or Chris or Chad talking back and forth. And, you know, all of us kind of grouped up as we go in at halftime. And so that momentum was there mm-hmm. uh, coming back out after halftime. Now, you've coached in <clears> – <throat> how many state games did you coach in? Three? Four? Three. And one, three. two. Yeah, three. What Now, you're also 17, 18 years old when you're playing in this, but I got to imagine as a coach, are you more nervous when you're about to take the field in the state championship game? Or can you remember that far back when you were playing in the state championship? I don't remember being nervous as a player. Um, I'm sure I was right. Um, definitely nervous as a coach. Um, but you know, it, it, once you get to the state game, it's, it's like, you've already kind of won. Right. And now you just want to try to get the gold, I guess. Yeah. And so those nerves to me weren't as great 
as they were in maybe the semifinal games. Now, right. You were pretty much knew you were going to go in the state finals all three years. You were by far the best football team going to the state finals. The first year Mason beat you, all right? Yes. And they had a better football team probably. Oh, yeah. They, they, I mean, they were better. But other than well, the other were, two years, you were the best team in the state. Well, I, I, I don't know if everybody gave us that credit to be, you know, being the best, but we ended up being the best. Did, did uh, you have James in all three or just the first two? Yes. All three? Yes. Yeah, he was a senior the last year. Yeah, he was okay. a sophomore. So he was a sophomore. Yeah, so so when we played Mason, the difference in that game was up front. Yeah, they, their line was they just had monsters. A, they had one of the biggest offensive lines for that class for our classification that I'd ever seen, and they just physically beat us up front. And then we actually tried to make a run right at you know third and fourth quarter just to you know close the gap a little bit, but they were just they were just really really good. And this backstory, this too, your your oldest son Hagen. Is your, is your is your quarterback? He's your mm-hmm. star. Mm-hmm. So you're not only a coach; you got your son playing. You're a dad, you're a dad. Yeah, because one of the most emotional things ever in the history of state te- at Texas high school football is Wayne is is Hagen scoring a touchdown to win the second the, the, your first state championship as a coach. Oh yeah, it was like fourth down maybe. Uh, let's see, it, it it was fourth down. I think it was like no, actually it was third down and twelve. And I remember telling Jeremy, Jeremy was calling our plays, and I said, you know, if we don't make it this, we're kicking the field goal. <laughs> and so, call a good play. <laughs> <laughs> put it on Coach West. <laughs> no, and, you know, our philosophy was try to put the ball in, in, in our best players' hands. And Was this against and, Mark? Yes. I'll see if I can find it. And so, um, we, 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 just called, uh, we just called, you know, our quarterback sweep to the right. On third and twelve, this is how good a kid player I believe Hagen it was. was. Uh, is he a third and ten, third and eleven, third and twelve? I can't remember exactly. It might have been a little shorter, but I know, I know we were in field goal range. There was about thirty or less than a minute left in the game, and uh, and that was going to be our last play, or we were kicking the field goal, and he scored. Now let's is set this, this up right for, the, here? for the people in the United, for the rest of the people in the world that don't know third this. And, it third looks like forty-five seconds left. Third and five. Oh, so you were so you're down at the nine. Yep, third and six or something. Yeah, that's so. That's yeah. So that's third down isn't on it? YouTube. We and got you it. and you said we're kicking a field goal, so call a good play. And Hagen takes it to the house, and then there's yeah. a touchdown. That was sweeper out right cue. That's how we call that. So everybody in the United States, it's not a state, a, a, a Texas in Texas. You're not just playing football somewhere. You're playing in the palace of football. You're playing in Jerry's world. Mm-hmm. What is that like? Because when you played state, like you just go to some Would y'all random. Play you go to some random um, stadium. We played in Weatherford, the okay. old kangaroo stadium. There, there you go. Big and, difference. And there was snow on the ground. <laughs> right. It was cold, and like they said, uh, mom that still remembers, gives me chills watching that. Yeah, she was in the band, and she remembers. Uh, like there it is. There you are, right there. Um. Well, she, Mitch still looks like a perfect <laughs> fucker, didn't he? Right there. <laughs> but but mom remembers your the state game that you played in. Um, instruments are sticking to their lips, and like it was a nasty weather game in '83. Yeah, the year yes, you played. Yes. Now you're in you know it's heated, seventy-two degrees. Perfect weather. Yeah. What? So the climate can't be a factor, you know, when when you're getting to play indoors and on turf. But I will tell you this about Texas Stadium. You know, we played. <clears throat> There were several times we played when there was, I mean, it was cold, moisture. Yeah. That was the year up of to the, this game. It was the year of the screwed up schedule. Yes, ice and snow. And, and I'm not sure if it was this year or the year after. We played three ball games within a week. Yeah, like on a Wednesday night, no, uh, because the state Monday was, night and because it's TV down to play on the TV. How do you do that? They had like, to. How do you even get ready for three games in seven days? It's you got hard. The best team in the state. Well, you, <laughs> you you have some really smart kids and some really good athletes. But I mean, uh, seriously, like at that at that stage of the year, you're not putting in a whole lot that's new. No, like, no, we, kids you, know it. They've been do, running it for twelve weeks. You do what you do, and, for and sixteen weeks. Yeah, the, our philosophy was all we're going to do what we do, and we're not going to add stuff late. Right. You know, that's when people get really confused, and and because of that philosophy, we could execute really well at a high level. And so it's mainly just, you know, figuring out what they do, mm-hmm. what we had to stop, you know, making sure we could block all their fronts, pick up all their blitzes, and then just execute. But, that lady is not but, happy right there. But back to the climate, when you get in Texas Stadium, the one thing that, that coaches 
don't realize and that you kind of need to prepare for is is the climate's different in in AT and T Stadium. We were sweated down. I mean, it's hot. Really? I mean, it, it's a lot hotter in there than you think playing mm. football. And if you watch us against Shiner, we threw a lot of uh, uh, wide receiver screens early in the game, mm -hmm. and so every you know their defense having to run sideline to sideline. We our philosophy was we're going to throw screens even if they don't work just to get people running sideline to sideline. You watch in the third and – well, actually, it's the fourth quarter. Their stud middle linebacker has the angle on Bo Wimberly, our quarterback, at that particular time. Can't get there. He is, really, he's he's, he's, he's gassed. gassed. He's out of gas. I mean, he's just toasted. And and it's a lot of that's the climate inside AT&T Stadium. So, so nobody thinks about it being hotter in there. Right. And it and actually is. If you're playing in August, it's cool and air conditioned. It's nice. <laughs> but by this time, you're winterized. We don't right. practice in bubbles. You're your class A, two A football team. Right. You're practicing outside in the elements. If it's real shitty, you might have practiced in the gym going through something if it's ice or rain or whatever. Oh, yeah. But you're practicing outside every single day. Yes. And so them kids are used to 40 degree days or 50 in, in December yes. and it's 72 degrees and they're humid. Yes. Yes. That makes a lot of sense. I never had. You don't think about that where the mm -hmm. pros are used to that because they, they're in like they're the Cowboys. All the time. They practice at the star. It's inside all the time anyway. So they're mm -hmm. used to 70. That's why they're so miserable when it goes outside to play in Buffalo or something. I would suppose so. Yeah. Um. You, so you, you coach, you grew up in Knox City, you win state championship, you go to San Angelo State. Well, actually, I went to Cisco first. You went to Cisco. Boy, I bet that yeah. was an, a, a hell of an adventure, wasn't it? Uh, it was a culture shock. <laughs> <laughs> Coach Steele tells me about going to Ranger, and he said, just a whole different world. Yeah. But, you know, when I didn't have any any place else to go. That was the only, only school that recruited me out of high school. Uh, I'll never forget. I was in basketball practice. Coach Bob Keys comes by. And it was at the end of basketball practice, and he came up and talked to me and and – I, think, I don't know if he offered me then or a week later, but they offered me and, and sent a letter and said, if I make the traveling squad, they'd give me a three-quarter three quarter scholarship, and if I made the traveling squad during two days, then they'd put me on full ride. That's at Cisco Junior College. And so that's the only place I had to go. And so that's where I went. Mm -hmm. And you just learn to survive and you learn to adapt. And when I walked out on that field, there were probably 160 football players because they probably all were offered the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's busting their hump to get that. <laughs> and so one of the one of the things and one of the reasons I made it at Cisco Junior College is I remember uh, Coach Frazier was our defense coordinator at that particular time, and it was at the end of practice, and we were running wind sprints. Well, at Knox City, we we ran hard. I mean, our philosophy was you work hard, you get rewarded. Mm -hmm. And so we're on these wind sprints and I'm just I'm busting it on those forties and coming in first every time. And I don't know how many we ran, but I kept coming in first <laughs> and I caught the coach's eye, coach Fraser. And after practice, he, he pointed me out and he said, and that's how you're supposed to work because they want a state championship at Knox city, Texas. And da, 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 da. <laughs> and anyway, I ended up making the traveling squad that year and got a lot of playing time as a freshman. And I still think it's because, of busting my butt on those forties that, that caught the coach's eye. Hard, hard yeah. work pays off. Sometimes it does. Yeah. So you went from Cisco. Did you stay two years at Cisco? Two years. Two years. Mm -hmm. And then you got a scholarship at San Angelo. Yes. Did you play a lot at Angelo state? Yes. And you played with a first round draft pick there. Yes. Pierce Holt. Pierce Holt. That's right. Pier we had Pierce Holt as a defensive tackle and Dole Wysoon as the other defensive tackle. Did they both? And play he in was NFL? from wall and his brother played in the NFL. And I think Dole got, a tryout at you know at the at the pro level, but I don't know if he. There's James making the tackle. It. Now Pierce Holt was a guy. He went to well, the army, kinda. wasn't he? He he he. James did good. He you know he did he ever come up and hit you? If James got later? if if James ever got mad he defensively, is he is a soft. Yeah, player, if he so. ever got mad, now he could turn into he could turn into an animal. James, what, James I mean, is more of an offensive guy. What a good kid. Right. Oh, he's absolutely a good kid. So and a great man right now. So oh, he's yeah. a great guy. That makes me feel so good. He's still friends with all them Stanford boys he grew up with. Yes, he had, I, he hadn't changed. If I, I texted him not long ago and he texts me back, hey Judge, how are you? But just such a nice, you know. He's just a good kid. He's down to earth. He's yes. very humble. What? So, he's done a lot for Stanford too. Their athletic program. He's a good kid. So yeah. what happens with so Pierce was like twenty five years old, wasn't he? If I'm if I remember right, didn't he go to the army and then get back and go to 
to school or something? I'm not sure. Somebody told me that he only weighed like 190 pounds in high school, and then he just blew up. Didn't he go to the military, though, for a little bit? I'm not sure. I was thinking he went to the Army for a little bit. But anyways, he was the first-round pick and was an all-pro player for the Niners for a couple of times. Did he, Super Bowl champion. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody in Cisco? From Cristobal. 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 That's where Who's the, the most famous person for Cristobal? The guy from Survivor. No, that's not the most famous. Jack Pardee. No, it's the guy from Survivor. Jack Pardee is more famous than the guy you that, can't even come up with his Colby name. that Colby guy. He's Colby from fam- Survivor. Jack Pardee is an NFL Hall of Famer. Never Coach. heard of him. And it's embarrassing, isn't it? Never even heard of <laughs> so We go through this shit all the time. I didn't know he was this, from Christopher, but he just famous. This doesn't yes. say anything from, about him going to the army. Okay, well, home. maybe. Anyways, so anybody famous from Cisco? John Booty. The kid from that his son was the famous player? No, John Booty was a Who's cornerback. Did he his pl- he played his, for the Philadelphia Eagles. White guy or black guy? Black guy. Okay, different guy then. I'm thinking of John David Booty or whatever, that kid that went to LSU from No, no, this is John Booty. He was a cornerback, played for TCU, and ends up uh, playing for Philadelphia Eagles. Okay. And I played in the same secondary as he was. I was a free safety. He was a corner, but a great guy, you, hard worker. Okay, so you go to San Angelo. Now, mm-hmm. now, now Miss Kelly, you were you dating Miss Kelly when you went to Cisco? Yes. Breaking well, my heart. I guess after my... <laughs> After my first, after my freshman, well, this is we're going to get into the woods here. Uh, <laughs> Look at Andy laughing over there. <laughs> no, I'll say you. Actually, actually, I met Kelly when I, at a track meet, and she claims that I, I kind of blew her off at a track meet, and she's told me this story. I can see that. Yeah, and I might have. I don't know. She said you, you passed you gotta, out your school pictures by the gross. You got to no. play hard to get. Well, he no. did do that. You got to play a little hard to get. She we, says I did, but I didn't. Can we tell one golfing story that you told me on a golf course one time? <clears throat> he probably uh, don't remember. I, I probably can't remember. But I bet you losing ahead. your wallet at the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that. One. <laughs> I'm gonna plead the fifth on that. Can I fill it in? No, <laughs> no, absolutely not. <laughs> but it, no, I, I, uh, how Kelly and I finally started dating is I. I came home for the Monday. I think Monday was playing Union Hill at a football game in the afternoon. So I went to that game and I saw Kelly walk by and I was like, wow, man, she's grown up a lot. <laughs> she's grown up a lot. <laughs> how, many, how many years are between y'all? Two. Oh, yeah. So Now, Kelly won state in golf. Second. I thought second. she won state. No, she got okay. second. But it's about higher than you ever. So Kelly might be a better golfer than Wayne. Uh, uh, yes. She's and a really he, good golfer. She's really good for not ever practicing. It's it's kind of frustrating because I'll go out and practice, and then I'll finally talk her into going out and playing. And we go out and play, and she just hits it so straight and chips it so with so much finesse, and I'm over here having the chip yips. And <laughs> it, it's really frustrating. I'm going to tell you what, that was a big loss for Knox City when y'all left. It was a huge blessing when y'all came to Knox City because – Let's face it, things in Knox City were not going good. Then all of a sudden, Pretty Boy comes walking in. I remember when we hired you, everybody was like, we got to hire Wayne Hutchinson, Wayne Hutchinson, Wayne That's all I heard. Wayne, 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 Wayne. We were at Monday at a junior high prep track meet, and we were loaded with athletes in junior high when you got here. Would you not say that's probably oh, true? Yeah. That was a that's good some, group of kids. That's some really good athletes. And so, because yeah. I told them, I told a guy in Wichita Falls, I said, man, if we get us a coach over here, we got a bunch of good kids coming up, for young kids coming up. And – we're at the track meeting and I hired Wayne Hutchinson. Didn't know who Wayne he was, but heard about him. He was the legend. The, I think that big sign in town is home of Wayne <laughs> Hutchinson. So we're at this track meeting. Here comes this good looking guy, all smiles in his jogging suit. And I told Michelle, I said, I bet that's Wayne Hutchinson right there. She goes, Oh, how'd you know? Well, everybody could tell. <laughs> Pretty boy smile. It's like Steve Austin, the six million dollar man walking across oh, there. Oh, come on. Were you nervous coming here because it is your hometown? And I mean, there is the ele- you could shit the bed, I guess. He was like, a dog. He wasn't scared of nothing. No. Uh, you know, everybody always says that it's always hard to go back to your hometown and coach. Yeah. But I I I always loved Knox City and I didn't let that let that affect me. My philosophy was anywhere you go, it's what you make it. Yeah. And so I just came in with the attitude that we were gonna do things right and get after it, work hard. Like I said, get rewarded and you know, hardest thing is get kids to buy into your program and do it the way that you want it to be done. And well, you did it. And the kids here just bought in and they work hard. I'm telling you, when I got here, 
the Knox City boys worked hard. Yeah. And we pushed that weight room. Andy yeah. knows that. Yeah, we did. And, it, you know, I still – I. It's funny, like I, I got a degree in education, but I didn't pursue the coaching route. But I, I, I do. I'm, I'm active in my kids' sports. And the other day, my youngest, I tell him like, we don't walk anywhere. If you go somewhere, go. You're running. And get on the hop, right? The hop. Yeah, like let's let's get to this. So he struck out the inning before, and he was kind of pouting out in the field. And I was like, all right, guys, the inning was over. And I said, all right, let's get, let's get in the dugout. And he was walking. And I, I lit into him a little bit. And he's yeah. kind of a horse's ass to my grandkids. <laughs> and he's, he melts down. He's like, you just, you just, you, you just yell over every little thing. Like all the little things you just freak out about. And then I had my coach Hutch moment. And I'm like, well, that's just the way you're going to do the little things is the way you're going to do everything. Absolutely. And, you know, trying to teach that to an eight year old is, is a little though. different. <laughs> pain, uh, Reese is just like pain. Exactly. Small argues with you on everything and knows more than you know on everything. But I still catch myself and even like anything podcast or anything that I do, I always try to take care of the small things, no matter how, like it might be unnoticeable to somebody else. But if I notice it, it's something that needs to be addressed. Always do the little things right. If you can help it. Yeah. You, yeah. I used to preach out all the time. You got to do the little things for the big things to come into play. Well, when when I first moved to Knox City, I went the first football game I went to. We played Monday, and I think they beat us sixty three to seven. It was freaking embarrassing. I mean, embarrassing. I was, I'd come from a bigger school and it was a different type of atmosphere and stuff. And people were just there was nobody giving a shit. I'm like, what the? Hell? I just couldn't understand it. And the kid worked for me was a quarterback, and he was always wanted me to come to game. Me and Tony, y'all need to come to game and watch the game. Well, he was smoking a cigarette one day out here. I said, well, you don't need to smoke. I said, that ain't good for you. Oh, we don't, I don't ever get to go more than about two yards at a time anyways. I don't think it's really going to affect me. I thought, well, he's got a good point. <laughs> but yep. it was so different. And then we had the, <clears throat> the young kids, and we got involved with youth football and started things started going. And then when we hired you, it was a whole different transformation in our town because here's a guy who won here, and he knew what to expect with Knox City. Because Knox City was a very good athletic school in the 70s and 80s for a, a oh, long yeah. time. Oh, yeah. Back in the old bone. Oh, boom. This place, this place was loaded. Yeah. And but so was like Quanah. So was Kroll. And so was Haskell. Yeah. yeah. It was Rotan. A, everybody was loaded. And it was very competitive. But yes. when I got to Knox City, we weren't competitive. We were horrible. All our good kids were going to Monday every year. Every one of them. Well, you came here and all of a sudden that stopped. And then all of a sudden the shifted, the pendulum went from Monday to Knox City. And more than people on Monday did not like that stuff. <laughs> they still don't like you over there, I don't bet. <laughs> oh, I have a lot of friends at Monday. Well, they're good people. Oh, I, yeah. I, I great people. I I, I I love the rivalry with Monday. We don't have it no more, and that's bad. Yeah, that's surprising. Well, well we're you know, we're diff now. different classifications yeah. now. So. But, but but when you were here it was there and that was it was good because it was the rider old high atmosphere again mm -hmm. when it was Monday. But when I first got here it wasn't there, and then you brung that back. And then we were winning. I had a kid, listen to this, a kid at the casino the other day sitting next to me, and we we're talking. He goes, where are you from? I said, Knox City. He said, when I was in high school, we played them in the playoffs. I said, what year? It was 04, I think, or 03 or whatever it was. It had to have been from all, and I Albany. And I said, no, he's from Petrolia. Oh, oh. No. And I said. That would have been 01. I said, yeah. I said, you fuckers cost us a state championship. Yeah. He goes, he goes, y'all were the best team we played all year long. I said, I said, y'all were the only team in the state that could beat us that year. The only team that could beat us that year. Yeah, I remember that game. Played them at uh, Memorial, Memorial Stadium. Yep. And that was a good – but they were and, a good football team. Oh, they were loaded. Right. They were the very, quarterback very good. they had was damn good. Yeah, I believe his name was Creech. Yep. And, that and, running, the, and the running back set records at Midwestern State. Yeah, they, were, they, were, a, they were a loaded football mm -hmm. team. But we were a very good football team. We too. were, and and we played we played their tail off. I think we were ahead nineteen fourteen at halftime. We scored right before half. Was that your first year here? Second, second. So I was a freshman then. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. Yes, you were a freshman. Okay, yeah, that's right, that's right. But I remember walking in at halftime. We we're all sitting on the bench, and I looked at us. We were spent. I mean, we put everything in it just to just to be 19 we to 14 at halftime <laughs> and i was like oh lord and sure enough second half they they did they were, commence to putting it on us they were loaded but anyways that kid told me he said y'all was the best team we played that whole year by far he yeah, said y'all were the only team when we watched film that we were worried because he said y'all had a lot of speed a lot of speed yeah and he said but he did he told me he said that was the i said yeah y'all cost us winning state he goes, yeah. He said, y'all were by far the best team. And I was going to tell Andy that the other day. Being with that kid told me, so it was the best team they played all year was us. Yeah, we had a good team. You've co you 
when you coached me, it was 20 years ago. Have you noticed uh, the attitudes of kids? Like we bought into your program as soon as you came here. Like we were, all, especially on the because I was in the I was in the seventh grade going into the eighth grade your first year here. Because you came in the spring, you came like February or March, started building your program. Right. Have you noticed kind of towards the tail end of your career that it's harder to get kids to buy in to 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 your program and work that hard? Because if you look into like you know the media and everything, like kids don't want to work that hard anymore. Yeah, I think Do you see that. I've never been to a place where I haven't had kids that that didn't want to work hard. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're if they're out there, especially big schools, if they're out there, they're going to work hard. Uh, like when I was at at the small school, where there's not as much competition for recruiting and getting recruited or getting scholarships. There's to me more of a team concept. Mm -hmm. Everybody still works hard, but it's more of a team concept and they're not worried about getting theirs. But at the bigger school, the thing that I noticed was there's so much competition for scholarships and they're so worried about getting their yards, getting their really, they're worried about stats, stats and, and so, to me, that that was the biggest difference in, in that respect. There's a lot more eyes in the big school. Like, I'm in it for me. I'm in it for what I'm going to get out of this. Yeah, and, and, and it's not – don't get me wrong. I mean, we still had a really good team concept. It's just – it was just a little bit, you know, different dealing with kids in that respect. And then social media came. You know, I wasn't used to – show. you know, none of us were used to social media, but now that's a big, big deal. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. promoting yourself uh, because, they, you know, everybody thinks, well, if I don't go promote myself, they're not going to find me and I'm not going to get recruited and then therefore I'm not going to get a scholarship. Whereas my philosophy has always been, if you're good enough, they're going to find you. Yeah. And, and they will. Uh, but this day and age, you do have to be proactive and you have to promote yourself. I saw an eight-year-old. He goes by Baby Gronk on Instagram, I think. He's like eight or nine. And he's... He's promoting himself at, at eight years old. Like, there's no way to tell that an eight-year-old is going to amount to anything in 10 years. He might not even have the passion to play anymore with the way his parents are pushing him. True, true. And, and you, you're obviously not going to know how much he's going to grow or how big he's going to be. Let's see if I can pull up some of his workout videos. But there are some impressive young kids out there, and social media does get their name out there. Here he is. So he's... He's, uh, he goes by baby Gronk and I mean, yeah, he looks good in shorts and t-shirt, but I mean, I'll see if I can find one of his videos, but like he's, there's videos of him talking shit. Oh, here it is. Here's one of them. Uh, no, that wasn't it. I lied. But I mean, at eight years old, you're just, but like they're doing footwork drills and they're doing... I mean, I don't know anything about this kid, but it's not hard to look good in shorts and t-shirts. <laughs> That's exactly right. I'm betting you. I don't know. I, would, I went to the bathroom, so I just come back. I'm assuming this is probably a rich kid. 5'2", 120, fourth grader. Okay. It probably. I don't know about this kid. I'm betting you. Upper, middle class, white kid that works good. There's some kid in the ghetto right now that's going to get his scholarship. But this is his Instagram account. I mean, he's got three hundred nine thousand followers on Instagram. Oh, that, that's did you see the black kid that uh that looked like a grown ass man had neck tattoos and shit, and he was like fourteen last year or something. Did you? I, I do remember remember him, that. and we talked about him yeah. last year too. Look at his girlfriend. Yeah, no, like he's he's gone to all these different like LSU's hosted him, Ohio State's hosted him, Texas. Like I don't, I don't, I don't know what. There used to be a show on called Friday Night Talks. Did you ever see that? It was youth football in San Antonio, and these kids were ten and twelve years that. old, and they were good. And they won the state championship in the Snoop Dogg League and all this stuff. I would be interested to know how many kids off this super super youth football team actually got to play Division One football. I'm gonna bet it's not very many of them. No, it'd probably be maybe one, one at the most. Yeah, because only three percent of the entire nation can right. 
And just because your big, kid's big good deal. at 10 or 12 doesn't mean he's going to be good at 18. No, people just don't realize what it takes to be a Division One football player. I was talking to somebody the other day. Is Go watch the D3s. The yeah, D3s athletes. can play. Yep. And there's people that go D3, then end up in the pros. And be Hall of Famers. Yes. Yeah, just think. The competition out there, and, you know, with, with all of our – summer strength and conditioning that we do now and the weights and the speed training and the personal trainers and, and, and all that kids are just so much stronger, faster and quicker than they, they were, you know, 20 years ago. It's, it's amazing how soft how, tissue injuries. What do you think about that? Because when I was in school 20 years ago, uh, God, it makes me old. You, you <laughs> couldn't, you, you, there were certain dates that you had to abide by. Like you couldn't do anything organized football wise until whatever date. Now it's basically, you got them all summer, right? Like a coach all can be long. running drills for an hour. Right. You get them for an hour. Like, I think that kids need a little bit of time to check out I, personally. I'm a firm believer of that. Uh, I, I think there's going to be burnout not only with kids, but I think there's fixing to be – well, there already is burnout with coaches. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand why the UIL came in and said, hey, in the summer you, you're allowed to, to have strength and conditioning. You're allowed to work your kids out. I, I understand why they did it because of, you know, the bigger schools have – uh, you know, the richer schools, you know, their parents can pay personal trainers in the mm -hmm. summer and get their kids ahead of everybody else. So by saying, hey, y'all can do this in the summer, it's giving everybody, you know, a fair chance uh, to be the best athlete, athlete that they can and be able to work with professionals. But at the same time, now that they've allowed that to happen in the summer, well, coaches are expected to be up there in the summer. Yeah. But they're not getting paid. Right. And that was one of my big issues, uh, especially at the big school, is I was like, well, if you're going to work a man uh, extra, then you are to pay him, mm -hmm. and you are to pay him a fair fair wage. That's just the way um, that that I, I was brought up. And um, But they don't. And my philosophy was, well, why don't you just put all coaches on a 12-month contract? Right. And if you don't want to work in the summer, don't put them on a – 12 month contract and they don't have to come up there. But if you're, if you're going to work them in the summer, put them on a 12 month contract, you can work them out in the morning up until noon and then let them go because they've already put all those hours in during the season. Right. I mean, it's an unbelievable amount of hours that coaches actually put in, especially football coaches. I mean, that, to me, that's the sport that puts in the most hours. Mm -hmm. So if you put them on a 12 month contract, well, now you can justify them asking them to be up there in the summer. Right. But if you asked a coach, most of them probably wouldn't say it, but if you said, hey, would you rather have your time in the summer or do you, you want to be up there working out with those kids? <laughs> they want to be. They want to have well, their time. They're going to say they want to work out with those kids. No, that's a lie. But I'm that's telling you, <laughs> coaches need some time, and they need yeah. some time off because they're going to get burnt out. And now, like, I've got a younger uh, – my youngest son's coaching. Mm -hmm. Well, when he gets through at the end of the month, looks at his paycheck right now because he's in year two and he's not, you know, on step 15 or 16 where you can actually make a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. He's like, I'm not sure this is worth it. He yeah. could find and, another and, job in the summer and make more money. Yes, especially, you know, young coaches. So, you know, to me, there's a shortage in coaches. Mm -hmm. That's They're hard to find. Um, and if you – and here in, in some of these small six-man schools haven't figured out. So – they offer housing. Yeah. And only have to pay like three or four hundred dollars a month. They increase their coaching stipends. Try to try to limit the number of classes they have to teach because they're gone all the time because they're having to do all sports. Mm -hmm. And so that's more attractive for a young coach than a big six A job where you're working year round. What yeah. on the housing deal though, this is my thoughts on that. <laughs> it is a free place to live. Let's say a guy comes to Knox City and we give a coach a house, and he's going to be here for twenty years. Mm -hmm. And which it, that's small a big school, problem in Knox listen, City. Listen, right our now. problem is keeping a coach more than two, three years. Mm -hmm. Well, there's nowhere you, you for left us also, and you're a hometown boy. But I understand why you left. But I mean, right. it's hard to get people to stay in Knox City, and every small town is going through the same thing. But if you get a guy there and you give him a house for twenty years, in twenty years when he's retired, he's got to go find him a place to live. At least if you're in a big school and you buy a house when you're a young coach like Weezer's age. He mm -hmm. buys a house, and let's say he stays in 
Frisco or somewhere. By the time he retires, his house has gone up in value a bunch. He can yeah. sell it and move somewhere else and has a, a nest egg built up in what he's got in his house. Well, if you get a free house for 20 years, all of a sudden you're retired or get fired. You ain't got nowhere to live. Unless you're a good money manager and you, you know, how sock, many sock some of that stuff back? I've hang out with a lot of coaches. I don't know you other than you. Most of them aren't that good with their cash. <laughs> Coach most still them, kept his in an envelope. Yeah, yeah. One, one of my deals, my wife really gets mad at me, but I see you always got to be thinking ahead. Yeah, you're no fun to live you, with. You, I'm telling you, gotta you, right be now. One, you got to be one step ahead. <laughs> yeah, you, you're no fun to live with. I'm telling you, Kelly's more fun than you are. Uh, mo- most most uh, ads are on a 12 month contract, right? Yes, but all the others are on what 10. Well, like at uh, like at at Lubbock Monterey, I had I had eight slots, and these were my varsity coaches that were basically on eleven month contract. Mm-hmm. And then your junior high and freshman coaches were on just a you know a regular ten month contract. But they're expected, or you have to ask them, hey, we've got this weight program in the summer, and I need right. bodies up here. Yes, and and, and I'm sure a lot and, of them and are. our district was really good about. You know, we had a stipend yeah. that we could, like, dish out to all of our people that worked in the summer. Mm-hmm. But as many programs as we had and as many coaches as we had, when I figured all that up and tried to divvy out the amount of money that they gave us for a stipend, mm-hmm. I think they were making $15 an hour or 10 mm. So, Eesh. So go ask a coach who's put in all those hours <laughs> all year long. And would like a little break in the summer. Hey, you want to work for this fifteen dollars an hour? <laughs> and at that point, their time is more valuable than that fifteen bucks. Now, right. fifteen bucks is a, is a, it's good. I mean, that's a, it's it's a McDonald's little, wage now. You know, but eighties and nineties, it was you. You would have been like, hell yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. But we're lucky in in the coaching profession because kids. I mean, because coaches love kids and co- most coaches are highly competitive mm-hmm. that if you ask them to come up and right. put in extra time, They'll do free it. time yeah. for kids, they're going to do it. And we, they don't do it. They do it for the kids. Yeah. It's not for them. And, and they sacrifice their own families most of the time to go help a kid to become successful or help the program become successful. Mm-hmm. And that's just the character of most coaches. When you uh, when you left Knox City, you go to Stanford. So it was a bigger school, but it wasn't a big school still. You went from 100 kids in high school at Knox City to, what, 200 kids in Stanford, 225 maybe? Nah, it's probably about, yeah, I was under 200. So, so, so the school was double size. Then you go from Stanford mm-hmm. to Lubbock, Monterey, which was what, 17, 1800 kids? Uh, 2000, I believe. When you got to Lubbock Monterey and you went in that football room for the first time, you probably looked around and thought, I've got a lot of bodies here. <laughs> was it hard to do, 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 do kids fall through the cracks sometimes at the big schools? Because it's hard to know everybody. And you're a real no, I mean, you it's, were really good about knowing your kids and their families. And you can't do that at a big school. It's very, very hard. It's hard to, to know everybody. But the ones, the one, the, the players, you're, they you'll, stand you'll out. find them. You'll, they'll stand out and, that you'll know their name, uh, but we we tried as coaching staff to really take care of every kid because we felt like if 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 they if they're going to give their time to come be a part of our program, then we're going to try to take care of them as much as we can and help them be a part of something the best that we can. And you had more coaches there too. Yes, was that harder to deal with for you? Yes, that's the hardest thing in the big schools is is number one hiring coaches, hiring the right coaches with the right character that's going to buy into your philosophy that are going to be loyal as a head coach. That's the hardest thing, thing to do. And then managing, um, not only your football coaches, but you have to manage. So I was basically called a coordinator. So I was in charge of everything on Monterey's campus, even though I wasn't the AD. So basically I'm in charge of all of the programs, but honestly you can't, you can't juggle all those things at the same time, especially when football season's going on. So that's where our ADs would come in, our principals would come in, and they take a lot of that load off of you. When, but dealing with different coaches and different sports and trying to get them to buy into like a small school mentality of, hey, we want to share kids. We want to give kids opportunities to play more than just one sport. And that's hard to sell to a 5 or 6A coach. 
versus a one and two and three a coach where they're used to sharing kids mm-hmm. and playing multiple sports because they want them for their sport. Yes. I don't basketball. I don't want my, I don't want my basketball player playing tight end. In football. Right. And right. they play early. They, they got a basketball schedule that yes. they're going to start regardless of what you're doing. In yes. Football. And where, that makes it hard. Yes. When, um, but when you got to Knox City, you put together a hell of a staff. You put Mitch McLemore, who's a head coach at high school. He play, He coached with you all the way up until he went to – when you went to Monterey, he went to Big Spring, right? Yes. Okay. Well, he, he went, went to, to Junction. Little, Junction, then, then Big yeah. Spring. And now he's at Haskell. Right. Okay. You you had Jeremy West. Coach West is a – where's he at? Hamlin now? His he's Breckenridge. Breckenridge. Well, he's, he's got a weird title. He's now. like a girls coordinator, isn't he, or something? No. No, he's head uh, baseball and principal. Okay. Yeah. He's a principal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's funny. I love Jeremy. I hope his teachers give him shit like he gave everybody because <laughs> he deserves it. The best smart, Jeremy West smart story. Smart guy. He's the, a he's a really good one. The best Jeremy West story is uh teacher or parents pissed off that he was cussing in front of his kid. Their kid. And they have a meeting and parent says, Yeah, I don't appreciate you cussing in front of little Johnny. And he said, Cuss, what are you talking about? So yeah, you you said damn and hell in front of little Johnny, and I don't like that. And he said, "Damn and hell," he said. Those are words I say to keep from cussing. <laughs> he's a great guy, smart, smart, smart guy. He is. He's he's a really really good. I was blessed. I, you know, I, anywhere I've ever been, um, I've had I've had a really, I've had a really good coaching staff. Now Mitch and Jeremy, you know Mitch obviously is like a brother to me. We've been co- we coached together for fourteen years, and then I I'd known Jeremy for a while and had an opportunity to hire him at at Knox City, and and you know he's like a brother too. And we had Coach Howith, and we had Coach Welch. I inherited Coach Howith, and I inherited Coach Welch, but they just man they jumped in there and bought into our program, and and they're good. And here's the deal. They're good people, and they're sharp men, and they and they and they care about kids. And when you get, when you can hire good people, more than likely they're going to end up being good teachers, and they're going to be good coaches because they're good people, and they care, and they care about kids. Mm-hmm. And I've been fortunate everywhere I've been to hire good people. Well, well, you done a good job in Knox City. Larry is retired now at Rhineland, great guy, and Howith is our superintendent now. Right. I mean, and that. When you inherit a bunch of coaches, what do you have like a sit down meeting with them? Yeah, you try to go. You know, at the beginning of of your season, you'll you'll have certain things that you want to go through, expectations, and how to act, how to treat kids, and then part of it's just selling your program, you right? Know, X's and O's, and how you're going to do things, how you're going to talk to kids, how you're going to, you know, coach a position, and. You know, they just have to know what you want as a philosophy and transpire, tra- transit, or I don't even know the right word. Transition that into, into uh, the putting, kids. It, putting it into action, basically. Yes. Right. Yeah. And, and they, they all did a great job with that. Yeah. And every coach is different. Every coach has a different personality. And kids really don't give a crap how much you know until they absolutely know that you care about them and that you're in it for them. Mm-hmm. And I, I honestly had, had I always had a hard time with that because I always had high expectations, and I really, you know, there's a line between being a friend and being a coach, and you try to make sure that you don't ever cross that line. And so I was always kind of straightforward. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't joke around or do those kind of things. But I think every kid that I coached knew where I stood and knew that I cared about them. Uh, even though maybe I didn't show it like I maybe should have. So how, how do you get a kid to buy into a program? Because like, you know, a lot of times people buy into things when they see like, you know, I want you telling somebody, Hey, I want you in the weight room. Isn't as good. Like if they saw like kids are visual learners, right? right. So like, how do you verbally sell on a, I want you busting your ass five, six days a week. Well, I think, I think what you do is you, you know, you have to have a great attitude as a coach. You have to, you know, put the expectations out there, and you mm-hmm. got to preach exactly how you want things done. They're not going to buy into it till they see results. Right. And so, results in the weight room. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, they were benching one thirty five, and all of a sudden, because of what you told them or what you coached or how you're you're doing your reps right. and sets, until they see that there are results, they're not going to buy in. Just mm-hmm. like in any sport. 
kids are going to buy in if you're successful. Mm -hmm. And if they, if you're, if you're teaching them, like say we're, we're running, you know, the counter, the GT, and I'm teaching you, you know, to, to read the defensive end and keep it. If he closes down, you're not going to buy into that until it becomes game time and you take your steps and you ride the guy up in there and that defensive end takes the dive. And then all of a sudden you pull it and you go skirt for 20, 25 yards or go score. Once you do that and you have that success, you're going to go, oh, then you Oaks knew what the heck he was talking right. about. Right. Do you think we'll ever see a day where the, the running game will come back again? Like the a, veer? The veer, the wishbone? Oh, it's a, it's out there. Uh, we had to defend that, uh, you know, against uh, Amarillo Tascosa. They they were full-blown, triple option, fly bone uh, You don't see that much no more. Do no. you think it'll make a comeback again, though? Yeah, I think it. I I don't think it's going away. Midland High runs it. They were really really good at it. Is that hard um, to defend? Because Jeff said, yes. like, if if you got a team that can run the veer and run it effectively, no, I said the single wing. Joe Bob Tyler single oh, wing. Yeah. If you got, some I would guys hate that to defend block, it. I would hate to defend it. It's gonna be five yards up your ass every time. And then they can get you with misdirection. And the thing about the veer that that the reason I think it'll stay around, especially small schools too, which I. I'm I'm spread now. I mean, I you know when I first came here, I yeah. was I, I wish we were running what I ran a little later mm -hmm. when I had you because you would have been way more yards passing than we did. Even though we were really right. good at what we did, yeah. You know, I I I, I wish we would have done that. But the thing about the beer is it always gives you a chance because you can line up with small offensive linemen because you're always going to be angle blocking. You're going to be able to block down, or you're going to be able to kick out. And it's not always run downhill power stuff. So that gives you a chance at, you know, small school, big school to be successful to, if you don't have those big offensive linemen. The uh, the, the single wing that Old High run or did under Joe Bob mm -hmm. is basic offense that you see in the NFL today, except they've taken the blocking back and the wing back and they've put them as wide receivers. It's the same fucking offense, though. You've got two guys. Do nobody, they don't. Nobody's the, under center. The wishbone? No, no, no. The single wing. Ever that? It's a deep yeah. snap. Well, you got two guys back there. You can either hand it off or something. Oh. The basic single wing. But they've taken the block and back and the wing back instead of having them in the spread backfield. They've spread them out. That's the same offense every team's running nowadays. But I wondered if yeah. we was going to see a true running team come back again because everything seems to come around. Oh, it'll. It, it hadn't gone away. I don't think. And it'll be a time eating clock, like you said. The littler guys. Because everybody runs a spread now that you ran that you ran. Yeah, but and, and, and a lot of people have the mis misconception of what the spread offense really is. You know, they think well because you got them spread out, you're just a passing team. Well, we've had more success running the ball out of the spread than we have passing the ball. You've a just lot taken of times. eleven guys and put them all over the football field, just having to defend you. Well, we've cleaned up the box. Yeah, you know, we've cleaned because up the they box. They have to get out. They have to get out because if they don't go cover them, then you throw it out there. And the you know the screen game, wide receiver screen game, is you know obviously helped that. But you know our philosophy was we're gonna we're gonna look at the box, mm -hmm. and if there's six in the box, you know we're you know we can run it, we can block five of you and read one of you and still be successful. But if you put seven in the box, we're probably gonna throw it, or we're gonna have to go get us a tight end and bring a tight end in to give us enough to block seven. But when you bring that tight end in, now that defense coordinator is going to bring that safety over there, put him over the tight end. Now there's eight in the box. So yeah. it's, you know, it's a chess match and it comes down to matchups and are your guys better than their guys up front. But running the spread gives you a chance, in my opinion, because if they're mm -hmm. just bigger than you up front and you can't block them, you better be able to spread them out mm -hmm. and at least get the ball into some receiver's hands that might make somebody miss in grass and go score. At least gives you a chance, right? It's a lot better but, than the old time football when you were going to get beat fifty to nothing and, and nothing you could do yeah, it. and, that, and that. that's the reason we ended up going to spread at, at Stanford is <coughs> we lined up against yeah. Albany and we were running. I said we're going to run double wing because we got this big old fullback and our offensive linemen are pretty good size. I think we can just run smash mouth football, run the clock, <laughs> keep you know score down, win the game with good defense, and we go over there and. I think we ran 20 plays in the first scrimmage, and I think we made maybe five yards. <laughs> and then you play a quarter, right? Yeah. So then we come back, and we in the quarter, we had a little spread package that we had been working on. We were wanting to go, you know, power football and then possibly run spread. 
And I found out in my coaching career that was a mistake. It's hard to run a, a power offense bringing everybody in and a spread offense at the same time because right. you end up doing too much and everybody is confused. So finally, we sh- <coughs> to make the story <coughs> shorter. You want some water? Sure. We, uh, in that scrimmage, we go to the spread. And all of a sudden, we're running the ball up and down the field. <laughs> and 30 minutes earlier, we couldn't make five yards. <laughs> and so I, we were walking off the field, and I remember it. Uh, Telling Coach Mack, I said, well, we're going to spread. We're spread from now That's on. That's what we're doing. And from that point on, we ran a version of the spread, and then uh, we we got into uh, uh, the Franklin system, uh, uh, Tony Franklin system, who was teaching the spread about 15 years ago. We were one of the first ones to kind of get into that. Canadian mm-hmm. was one of the first ones to get into that, and you know how much success they had. Yep. And, and we learned a lot about the spread. And – Honestly, if we hadn't have done that in Stanford, now we had the talent, we had the, but we had the pieces of the puzzle to run a mm-hmm. true spread. Right. And had we not done that, I don't think we would have won state. But because we did sell out and go straight spread, it definitely helped our chances win. State. What's that like? Because you've gone all the way, th- you've gone all the way through two a days uh, doing this power offense, and then all of a sudden you're in your scrimmage, and I'm assuming it's the last scrimmage because that's when the live quarter is. And now it's like, wait a second, we're gonna go, we're gonna spread you out right before the first. Yeah, game. It, it wasn't too bad because we we were still running the same running plays, right? Except we 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 spread them out, and so as far as the blocking schemes, it didn't change, right? So all it changes is basically how we attack people in the air, mm-hmm. and we tried not, and even after we went to the spread, we tried not to get too sophisticated. We only ran probably five running plays at the most, and maybe five passing plays at the most. And then we had a plethora of screens. And then what Jeremy did a really good job of, and as what we did a good job of as a staff is we would take those plays and we would window dress them every week. So if we were running the same play, Mm -hmm. but we may add motion or we may add a, you know, out of a different formation that we run that particular play out, but we were still running the same play. Right. But from a defense, defensive perspective, Looks totally you're like, different. that's not what we prepared for. Right. Because of window dressing it, or what I call window dressing. Now, you wouldn't run a play in a game if you didn't practice it X amount of times, right? Right. And a lot of times we'd practice a play an X amount of times, too many times in a practice, and then never run it in the game. And Coach Steele is is he was famous for ten minutes before the game. He's like, I wonder what this will do, and he would run it in a game. And Howith tells stories of going from you to Steele, and it's just like, oh my god, like Wayne would never draw up a play ten minutes before a game and then call in the team and be like, hey, we're gonna we're gonna run this opening play of the game or whatever. And he's just like, holy cow. <laughs> oh, steel boy. You, he just, he just, he'll just come up with shit and he'll draw it in the sand. <laughs> and probably work. And then we're going to run it. Different type guys. Both great friends. But that just, but that just shows the different, the, the dichotomy of coaching staff. Like you, you are, we're going to practice it. And if we don't practice it, we're not going to run it. And then there's guys that just let shit fly and one, make it work that way. One of your, I guess, rival coaches, I guess you'd say, I'm sure he's probably a friend of yours, is Denny Faith at Albany. Mm-hmm. They find he finally won his first state championship this year, didn't he? Yes. And he, how long has he been at Albany? Like five hundred years? I think someone told me like forty-one years. And won his first. I mean, has been very, very successful. Highly, a very highly successful, successful coach. Highly successful. Well deserved state championship for him. It was a thorn in our side our last couple of years of eleven man here in Knox City. Oh yeah, it was. Them all coming stuff. down killed us. I yeah. still don't like Albany. Yeah, I remember. I'm just now getting to where I can go eat at the Beehive. Yeah, we had they closed uh, it down. They closed it down. Well, we had an eight and two season that year. Yeah, yeah. And missed the playoffs. Missed the playoffs because high school was really good and Albany was really good, and we were eight and two. And we had eighty students, and they both had two hundred. And we were really good. Yeah, had we had been taking three teams in the playoffs, we would have went deep just like they did. Yeah, yeah. We had a great team. Right? Now that now they take three, don't they? Should or they take more than that, don't they? Four. four. So basically, you're a real loser if you don't make the playoffs these days, huh? <laughs> uh, pretty much. Why? Yeah. Are, why are they doing that? Money. Oh, more money for the playoff money. The AL makes money on playoffs. They do. That's what the bottom line is. Let's don't sugarcoat this. How much UIL's like the NCAA. The it's school all about doesn't money. hardly make any money. 
they make a little? Andy, oh, yeah, yeah, not much. Tell him what you told me about this, what y'all's basketball. We go to the the playoff basketball game we saw y'all at was packed. Right, at, at right, right. Ask Andy how much money Knox City made off that. Eighty two dollars. No way. By the time we paid, well, for officials, refs, officials the venue, are high now. Yeah. Hey, you that's, got, that's, that's a, how you're getting officials now is you got to pay them. But that's another yeah. thing. The Amarillo chapter has told all 1A schools you will not get an official on Friday night in, Amar- in that Amarillo chapter. Yeah, there's a shortage, definitely. I, I wanted to ask you about this. I'm glad we got on to officials. Officials are horrible these days. But nobody... Hold on a second. And you're the reason. This this is your I'm fault. I'm the reason. I don't no, this shit. is your fault. Nobody's going to that profession anymore. How is that my fault? Because you're an asshole about officials. <laughs> Could you, you who, ever hear me who, screaming an official when you would, coach? Who would no. want that job? Seriously. Who no. wants to go be an official today? Nobody. Nobody. Nobody's going to do it. That's, That's no, why there's a shortage. It's because these pussies we raise today are soft. No, it's because <laughs> yes, no, they don't want to do People are soft. What, an official. And I've heard that volleyball, if you're going to go the official route, do volleyball. Because you get paid like per game and uh, you know it's uh, that's in or out. Officials are terrible these days. It is bad officiating. I've yeah. never heard you really complain about officials much. I never heard you really it, ever complain about a, officiating. It's a definitely a thankless job. I it's I have respect for every one of those referees because it, it is a tough, tough job having to deal with our society nowadays. I, I would agree with you on that. And, and they don't get paid well, they're getting paid a lot more, but they're still not paid enough. To deal with some of the, the things that they And it's still their second with. job. Like, they've got a career. Oh, yeah. Not, I mean, it's not like that they're oh, yeah. officiating full-time. This is something that they do because the they NFL. have a love for the kids. They love they love sports. And right. they, you know, they, and they spend Friday, and, Thursday, Friday, Saturday night. And it's a passion for them. Yeah. <laughs> Dad was a fireman with a guy that refereed six-man football in the 70s. And he told Dad one time he went to some game, Chillicothe versus Benjamin, two small schools back in the day. And he said he'd been doing 11-man games. I had him do a six-man game. He told Dad, he said, first play guy takes it 75 yards. Next play guy goes 75 yards the other way. And the third, he said, by the fifth touchdown, he said, I just called it from the half, from the 40-yard line. <laughs> I just both ways. He said, they ran my ass off. Uh, yeah. But the NFL's officiating is horrible. It is. You watch games and you're like, how? And it's not just NFL. It's basketball. It's everything. And I don't know if we've just gotten faster human beings and the eyes are slower but officials are, and they control every outcome of things now. More yeah. every big game. Let me ask comes you this, down because, to a shitty call. It's a, because the it's Super a good, Bowl. Good thing we have instant replay. It is. But do, it's a good what thing. do you think? Do you think when it's like uh, down to the last ninety seconds, refs should stay out of it because the Super Bowl wasn't? I mean, it was kind of. There was a call in there. If Philadelphia, if they don't call that on the play, then Kansas City has to kick a field goal, right. and then Philadelphia has a chance to go down and tie the game or win the game. Right. Yeah. I th- I think keep. The whistle, choke on your whistle. Keep the keep the flag in your pocket. I just think let them play. That if it's if it's going to, you know, make the outcome of the play different. Yeah. At the point of attack. If it's blatant. If it's at the point of attack, call it. But if it's on the other side of the field and there's a holding going on and it doesn't affect at the point of attack, leave your flag in your pocket. Right. You can call don't, holding on every play. Yes. Yeah, so, so don't, you know, don't be the cause of the outcome yeah. of the game. Well, like Cincinnati. Unless, and now if it's at the point of attack and right. it's a blatant foul, call it. Mm-hmm. Have enough, there's a lot that don't have enough guts to call it that could flip the game the other way. Mm-hmm. But if it's at the point of attack and if that guy hadn't held, the defender makes the play and you're, you know, call it. One one of the, that, that's what I always got frustrated about. Right, it's like the holding. It's the holding mm-hmm. penalty that, that has no relevant no to the play. bearing yeah. on. Yeah, and then the other thing that always used to make me mad as a head coach was, all right, you run the ball down the field, you get down to the twenty yard line. Yeah, not a flag one has been thrown. <laughs> right, but you get inside the twenty yard line, and all of a sudden, holding. Yeah. So now, what does that do to you? Back Everybody thirty five, thirty, and. I'm promise you nine times out of ten you're not going to go score yeah. because of that penalty inside the twenty. Right. Had now, you not got that penalty inside the twenty, you're probably going to score. But I don't know how many times in my career that nothing's ever called until you get down inside the twenty, fifteen, or ten, and then all of a sudden there's holding. But why is that? Are they looking more? Or I are they, have no are they idea. Trying, are they like you don't their think pants? your kids were guilty of this thing? <laughs> I don't know. But you know, it's just, just always for us in the <laughs> NFL playoffs last year. The Chiefs in the Bengals, the kid from Cincinnati does a stupid play at the end of the game, and they kick a field goal lose. 
So everybody's like, well, you're protecting my homes. Then we go to the Super Bowl, and then you get the same thing back to back. I don't know if they protect the good players or we just notice when they get the breaks. I don't remember as much about the Super yeah. Bowl. The Super Bowl, Jalen or Kansas City, they got a they called a called a guy for holding uh on Juju. And, and, and defensive it, pass interference or yeah, yeah was, and I remember holding. that it was kind of just a grab. It was a kind of a t- it, it was it's, it's a ticky tacky gra- call. He grabbed him. He should have. Wayne, he's a Kansas that. City fan, so he's a Mahomes <laughs> guy. But but he did grab him. But the ball wasn't going to be catchable anyways, and they would have kicked a field goal and been ahead. Well, and, that's that's always been an argument of mine. How do you know it wasn't catchable? If he right. hadn't grabbed his jersey, he might have got there. And they always say, "No, I." Hutch. It's uncatchable. Well, how do you know that? Let's show the play again. And you're I'm going to try to find it. Are you still colorblind? The end of the yes. Game. Didn't you get some glasses? Some shades. Did they work? Somewhat. Do you not like it as much? Or do you? It, it didn't. It wasn't like, it wasn't earth shattering. You almost killed my kid one time because you was colorblind. How's that? You was driving somewhere and you had right. to, you asked him, what color is oh, that? Oh, yeah. Uh, it, it was, yeah, I do have problems with that. <laughs> <laughs> if it's more than three lights, it gives you hell. Yeah. <laughs> Every small town I go through and that has that one light flashing, I'm like, <laughs> is that, <laughs> is that a stop or, yellow, or is that caution? Andy or CJ or something told me that one time. Well, Power lift Almost killed us. He yeah. said, y'all tell yeah. me if that's red or green or yellow or whatever. It yeah, that was probably one of those long nights we're coming home from Houston when the powerlifting, state powerlifting meet was in Houston and we're yeah. driving through small towns at three o'clock in the morning. Coming up to the light. What is this? What is this? Here it is. 35 35. Okay, here we go. And he he didn't grab him. Anthony Bradford. Uh, there's now, a different now view. I remember. There's a different view of that. He, he hooks him a little bit. Now I remember this. But if they don't call that, it's 38-35, Philadelphia's got a chance to go play. Right. I, I don't care one way or another. I was pulling for Philadelphia just because everybody in West Texas is a Kansas City fan. I grew is up it gonna fan. show? Is this going to show a different angle? I bet it will. Probably so. The guy says that he hooked him. I mean, the player did. Here it is. That. Where? Yeah. It just barely. No. I had to right at the beginning. That, in five yards, you can do it, though. <laughs> well, I guess that's NFL, right? That was a pussy ass call. It's, in, it's uncatchable anyway. He that lost is, the ball. That is a weak call. I think he. But look how close. If he doesn't grab him, he doesn't. They much slowed that down. See, I think I, he. Yeah, I don't know if he could. have That's a weak ass call, anyways. But officials covered that. But I don't think. But it was the at la- the. It was at the point of attack. In the last two minutes, I don't think that that's blatant enough that they should. It's on the line of scrimmage though, too. I don't okay. I still don't think it's blatant enough. Look at the Cincinnati call. You can't that, hold the him. Cincinnati call, the guy hit the guy out of bounds, yeah. hit Mahomes out of bounds. No doubt about it. Yeah, that was stupid. That was that was a dumb play. But I mean, it's it is it. Is. And you know what? I'm Mahomes so I'm a, really surprised the back judge back there called it. Kansas City is a classy act. Andy Reid's a hell of a coach, and Mahomes is a hell of a quarterback. So it, it don't matter. Right. I'm ready for football to start already. Anyways, drafts next Thursday. Yeah. <clears throat> what is the? I'm going to ask you a dumb question here, and I probably know this answer. <laughs> Your team that once stayed at Stanford mm-hmm. with Hagen quarterback was probably the best team you ever had. Is that quarter true? Uh, that's it. Both of those teams were identical. Could they have beaten your Monterey team that made the playoffs? Depends on what year. Because the bigger school is a different game. Yeah, it is. A lot more talent. Not Maybe not one talented or two talented, we but have, your 10th kid we, at, at uh, Monterey is better than your I will say, kid. I will say skill-wise, we would have matched up pretty well. But the blind. Right. But – in the trenches, we would have probably got our nose blood. And that's where the ball, and that's where the game's won anyways. <laughs> yes. But that's the difference between the big schools, just so much faster. Not maybe the players not as fast or They're, one or two, but the average overall We had a lot of speed at Stanford, so that's why I'm saying we would have matched up well with Monterey skill wise. But up front, defensive, you know, defensive line and linebackers, I mean, they were strong, big, and could move. And that would have been the difference. Just like when we played Mason, those offensive linemen from Mason could have played for us at at, um, at Monterey. They were mm-hmm. big and strong, corn fed, and could get after you. How how long did you coach from the time you started at Archer City? That was your first job was Archer City, right? My first job was at Kermit. And then you went to Archer City. Yes. Okay, and then Archer City to Abilene High, Archer City to White Right, and then to Abilene. God dang, boy, Abilene. Got more fucking job in Jamaican. How many hours do you think you would put in on in a week? In a week? Yes. Uh, you talking about counting the school day? Or, work. Let's or after? Work. 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 From I mean, the time, I mean, because basically by the time you wake up, you're, you're, yeah, we you're would, going. Yeah, I would get at the, I'd get to the office at 6.30 at 
Lubbock and maybe 6.30 at night. 12 hours a day. Um, during the week. But then Monday night, I'd have junior high football Oof. that I'd have to be in. So Monday nights, I'd get in at 9. Tuesday, we'd have junior high football. I'd get in at 9. So Wednesday was kind of our... Your day. Yeah, we called it heyday. You remember heyday? Yeah. Eight, eight and eight out the gate. Eight and eight out the gate. We tried to keep that philosophy because... You know, coaches need to break, kids need to break. And I wanted them fresh for Friday night. And then Thursday night we'd have JV games, mm-hmm. and so that's another nine o'clock, nine thirty. So ninety nine. hours a week. I don't know if we put ninety. And then of course you have Friday night, and if it's out town game coming in from Amarillo, we'd get home two o'clock in the morning, be back up at eight thirty yep. Saturday morning. I'd have try to have the guys out of there two two thirty on Saturday, and then Sunday. We would uh, come back after lunch and go from one to about five. Whenever you're spending that many hours on something and then you retire, what is that like? Because it's been your entire life. Since August, you're going to go and you're going to do honeydews now. You're going to bust your ass for 90 hours a week, 89 hours a week. Okay. So, like, now it's zero. So, when I retired, uh, turn turn this a little bit. Yeah, there you go. Right here. Yep, yep. Short well, faces. When, yeah. When I when I retired at Monterey, uh, they took care of me, so I would report to the AD's office every day. Because when when you retire, you, you you know, you're not as important on campus anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you find out how 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 much they didn't. You're a nobody you. now. You, you, right. you, you become. They move on quick. You become somebody to nobody overnight, <laughs> and uh, you're not quite as important as maybe you thought you were. And so I'd report to the AD's office every day. And they'd take care of me. And uh, so that transitioning to where you're just go, 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 go all the time, right. it was like, man, this is going to be an adjustment. <laughs> and then on the weekends where you're always watching film or mm-hmm. doing something, it just takes – it It probably took me two months to kind of wind back down to go hop, you know, jump out of bed and go, well, I, I have to be here. Oh, wait a minute. Mm-hmm. I don't have to be there. Right, and that's kind of a good feeling too, when you don't have to be there all the time. My stress level actually went way, way down, because at home, you know, I mean, you're always thinking, you're always on call, mm-hmm. and you never know what's around the next corner. Yeah, because you're in charge of everything on that campus, so you're always worried that something's going to happen. Yeah, and to to get to where you don't have to worry about that anymore, it took quite an adjustment. Did you boss Kelly around whenever you retired? Because I've got a friend, and his dad retired. His dad was like a CEO for McDonald's, high, <laughs> higher up at McDonald's. And he had people that worked under him. So he, right. he was always kind of the man in charge. And whenever he retired, his wife had to have a sit-down meeting with him like, listen, I'm not your employee. <laughs> like they're, You're talking to me like yeah. I am your employee. Because he, w- he was never around to see kind of how she ran the house. So he's like... Right. Why are you doing this that way? Like, that's not efficient at all. Did y'all yeah. ever butt heads? Because she retired the year before you, right? No. No, the we year retired, after. We retired the same time. Same time? Oh, uh, God. We haven't had a sit down yet. Not yet. It may be coming. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe after this podcast. <laughs> she, I don't know. She gets a little irritated at me right now, but. what? I'll, I'll, I'll change it from, save you from Kelly kicking your rear end. Of all your coaching stops, who's the best player you ever coached against? Against? I'm not going to ask you who because you're going to hurt someone's feelings out there because I'm saying James Washington's the best player because he's an NFL second round draft pick. So I think that I think right. that solidifies. So you that. asking who, who the I best coached? coach that you played coached against? Against. So not one of my players. No. no. I'm just going to do James since he's the only one in the NFL you coach. I think that's Coach fair. Mack didn't even say James. Coach Mack. Who'd Coach Mack say? He said another kid. Ty McLemore. No, he didn't say Ty McLemore. He knows <laughs> no, they were all good. Uh, I think there was a running back y'all had that he put ahead of James. The best player that we that I ever coached against. I, I can't just name He wasn't somebody. that worried about anybody he coached against. I'm trying to think. When you was at Abilene High, you coached against well, some now, guys that played. Now, when I was at Abilene High, the best player that we coached against was obviously Cedric Benson. Well, yeah. So he, he was, was a straight very talented. Stud. Yes. Very, very, very good. I, I saw uh, Adrian Peterson. He recently came out. Did you see what he said? He said, I was Texas through and through. I was going to the unit. He said, I went to I went to USC. I went to LSU, went to OU. And I, 
at every visit, I ask the head coach, when I come here, am I going to have a shot at the starting, starting job? And every one of them said yes, except for UT Mac Brown. Because he had Cedric Benson. He said, we've Cedric Benson's coming back for his senior year. I'm going to give it to Cedric. And he said, okay. And Adrian, then he went to OU. They said Adrian Peterson's one of the few guys that could went straight from high school to the pros. Yeah, he was stud. So Cedric Benson was one of the, was the best you coached against. Where, where did he go him. to high school at? Midland, Midland Lee. Midland Lee. Well, it's not Midland Lee anymore. Didn't they have to change their name because all Mid- that Midland, bullshit? Midland Legacy. Is that what they are now? Mm-hmm. That's about like stupid as Wichita Falls. If you're on the Wichita <laughs> Falls school board, you're a freaking idiot. I said that. Uh, <laughs> Jeff's still salty that about it. That pisses me off. It's uh, a waste of history. Dumbest yeah. shit ever. So uh, what else have you got? Uh, so so Cedric Benson, mm-hmm. who's the best player you coached, not counting James Washington? But oh, Didn't coach. you have some kid at Abilene High that played big? Didn't you have a defensive back there that went to Texas? The Ahmad Brooks or something? Oh, Ahmad. Yeah, he he was he he had just graduated when I got there. He was a stud. He was a stud. What's the hardest position to fill, like at a high school level? Like, it, what's the? It's just like an odd position that you're like, God damn, I don't think we're ever gonna find the right body to do this. Well, the one I always I always put, you know, obviously quarterback. That's right. the one. I mean, if you don't have so that have position that, intact, once, and if you don't have at least three that you're grooming to become yeah. the quarterback, the starting quarterback, or if you don't have at least three in a season that are that you know can step in and get you through a ball game, yeah. then, then you know forget about it. Yeah, you you could find yourself sitting there, you know, your first one goes down, so you, you got your backup ready. Mm-hmm. You think, oh, everything's good. Well, you're just one play away from injury. So he goes down. And if you haven't been working that third one, where, you know, and then we have six of them. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. Andy, that's where Andy gets all his worry and shit at is yeah. from you. God yeah. almighty. You got to always be thinking ahead, Jeff. Yeah. Anyway, how but, do you do that at a small school? I mean, your sample size is limited. Like your last you, year here. Yeah, but we always had three ready. I don't know who now, the third I'm not, one I'm not sure. I'm not sure the third one could have could have been much of a factor, but he could have he, he could have taken the snap and handed, handed the ball off. off. I when, guess that's all you need, right? Yeah, uh, but, but to answer your question, a uh, center is always uh, another one that I put a lot of stock in. You got to have a great center. Um, on a personal standpoint, it's got to be hard when you see a kid that has got a shitty life and mm-hmm. just does stupid shit that just cost himself his life. Because you've been around many kids that have done that. I know right. you have. Right. It just that's got to hurt so bad when there's a kid that just one or two decisions in his life. Is a difference between him getting out of whatever situation's in mm-hmm. and going to prison or just having a shitty life. I see that right in Knox City. We got some oh, kids yeah. in Knox City. It's that everywhere. I see, and I'm like, God, I might get put when you were 12 years old. You were not a bad kid, you know, and just. And, and, and what's frustrating is you can, you can call those kids in and you can talk to them and try to mentor them. And you think, yeah, maybe I got through to that kid. And then you look up a year later on down the road and then, you know, they've messed up and, you know, a lot of that's the environment they grew up in. Uh, yes. It's all they know. And sometimes it's hard to, to get that switch to turn over in their brain to, to do the, to do the right thing. A lot of times you used to tell me all the time on the golf course that the kids more, you get, you, you lose more games at the dinner table than you ever do on a football <laughs> field. Get beat at the supper table. But right? except that was your old saying. And I, and that makes a lot of sense. You've had right. two, you you, two things you told me. You told me that, and you told me one time, and I'd never had heard this since I've heard it a thousand times. It's easier for a poor man to go to heaven than it is for a rich guy. It's, it's like putting a needle through a what? – what is, what is your saying? I, camel through an eye of a needle. Yes. yes. You told me that playing golf one time. I don't know did if he's I, talking to me I don't personally remember about saying that. that but. <laughs> you, you, you did. I was probably jacking with you about something that you didn't want to talk about, and you told me, listen, it's – but but th- those are two But it's sayings. true. Yeah, they're very it's true. It is true. It is true. Uh, yes. Both, both of them. And so I've done a real good job of staying poor to help my chances of getting to heaven. I'm telling you, I've made a lot of bad choices to do that. Have you seen the new things that uh, I guess the state has done? Um, you have to work until you're 62 now. Yes. And that, and to me, that's hurt the coaching recruitment too. Yeah. Cause when, I'll be and honest, when, I, when you, I first started out, that was, I mean, that <clears throat> was enticing to see that, hey, you know what? I can retire when I'm 54 if I want to, because right. it's a rule of 80. And you know, sometimes you, you know, and and I was thinking, you know, you work you work ten months out of the year and you get your summers off, right? So that was 
you know, I was 31 years ago when I was coming out <coughs> of college, and I thought that's that's a pretty good deal. Get to retire early, only work, and get summers off, and you know, get to do something that you enjoy to do and mentor kids and those sort of things. And so that's one of the things that got me into coaching, other mm -hmm. than I had a passion for sports and right. you know, wanting to coach and teach kids. But you know, that definitely was out there. Now you're coming out of college and you're like, I got to work 12 months out of the year. Probably not going to get paid a month of those. <laughs> and I got to work till I'm 62. Yeah. And your, uh, the pay, the pay raises stop at your 20 of service. Ah, uh, is it 20? I think so. I think it is. So if you come out of college at 22, your last raise from the state is when you're 42. Right. So you've got 20 more years, unless your school district increases your increases pay. Increases it, right. You're working the last 20 years for the same amount of money that you worked at, 20, at year 20. Yeah. And those, I don't see, those raises are far and few between. I don't see how there, we're already, there's going to, there's a teacher shortage. And um, my aunt was telling me, like, we're about to lose two generations of teachers kind of at the same time. So we're going to lose the older generation that kind of did the retire, rehire. And then mm -hmm. we're just going to lose the teachers that are going to, are 52 now and they're about to retire or 54 or whatever. So like we're going to lose a big generation, two generations of teachers and there's nobody that is coming up to replace them. Cause if you look at college enrollment, college enrollment, especially nobody's going to be a teacher anymore. Right. So I don't know what's going to happen. It's hard enough as somebody that's on the school board to find bodies that want to be here. I don't know what it's going to look like in 10 years. Yeah. I think state's got to number one, come in and give everybody a raise. Yeah. Uh, that's got to happen. The other thing I've noticed on coaching that's got to happen is in the colleges, you know, back when I went to college, you could go into college, you could minor, uh, you could major into, like, you could major into kinesiology, but I could get a minor in biology or I could get a minor in mm -hmm. in history or whatever subject that I was going to uh, teach, I could get a minor in. Now, this generation, when you go to college, you have to major in like biology, major in history or English or whatever you're going to teach, and then it's basically you're getting a minor in kinesiology. Right. So that makes it a lot harder, especially for a student athlete mm -hmm. who's in sports because it's a full-time job in college being a student athlete now. It's hard for them to major in that and still come out and become a coach. Yeah, That's just my opinion, but I know that's happening. Well, um, And there's another thing that's going on too is – I'm sure whenever you went to college, you didn't really know all the jobs that were out there. Is it, you know, no. what, does that make sense? Like, right. like I know I've, I've got friends that are teachers and they're like, I became a teacher cause I didn't know what else I was going to do. Like it was either school or the hospital. Like those are the major employers where I came from. She's like, now, like I see with the cell phones and all this technology like, there's so many jobs that I had no clue about. Plus there's so many other jobs that have come along because of technology that's so, cool. like, kids, they're exposed to more because they see what else is out there. Like, it's not just, well, I love football, so I'm going to go be a coach. It's like, no, I did that for a little bit, but these other things have my interest. So, there's yeah, going to be, there's exactly going to come right. a day of reckoning for the uh, public public school, uh, just kind of who they're hiring. And I don't know what the answer is going to be. You got you got two boys. One's a coach. One wants to be a pro golfer, Correct. Correct. I'd rather be the golfer than the coach. Yeah, probably. yeah, he's he's living a good life right now. <laughs> so, would you want Wes to keep co coaching, or do you want to find him something else to do? What I, would you I, prefer that he do? I would love to see him keep keep. I would love to see him continue to coach because number one, I think he's I think he's in it for the right reasons. I think he does a really good job with kids, and I he has a passion for it. And I think if you have a passion for something, no, no matter what, you know, the monetary value of it is, you know, all of us want to make money, mm -hmm. but money's not everything. Damn sure helps. Though. It, it, it helps. Rent your but, misery you want. But you want to find a job that when you go to that job, it's like you haven't ever worked a day in your life. Mm -hmm. And if he has a passion for it and he enjoys it, then I think you ought to pursue, pursue it and not worry about the money. What makes you happy in life is going to make your life a lot better. 
Absolutely. And people that don't, I'm, I mean, I'm not very good example of that because I'm, I'm lucky. I hit the lottery in a job. I really did. I'm not make. I'm not ever going to die a wealthy, wealthy man. But I've had a great life. But you worked hard to get it. I don't even remember that. That's what's funny. Oh yeah, but you start. <laughs> I, no, no, I'm not disagreeing right. with you on that. But I don't remember that stuff. Sure. I don't. I don't remember because I liked what I was doing. Right. So I don't remember. I, I'm. I don't remember having to worry about paying an electric bill and get, and I knew all that was there. Fuck, I might have to be worried about it next month. Some of these people don't send me mm-hmm. some deposits. They owe me, but I don't. It's part of it. I don't remember that. You don't remember probably you and Kelly struggling to pay bills when you first got in. Yeah, well, you're I a do. tight ass, so you probably never have worried <laughs> I, about money anyways. I, I do remember. What but, was and, your and, first and, how much was your first coaching contract? How much did you make? Let me guess. Twenty five thousand a year. That's pretty close. I think I think we brought in maybe twenty five hundred a piece. Like five thousand together. Six thousand sixty thousand dollars a year was good money back then though. He was on high cotton. That's when you screw in everybody selling golf clubs in Wichita Falls. Wasn't it? <laughs> no. You know, I had a friend of mine that told me about you back in the 80s. Brandon Rogers. Oh, yeah, I know Brandon. Brandon told me one time he, he was talking about Wayne, and it, I didn't even put two and two together until I moved to uh, Knox City. We used to do a lot in golf clubs. Yeah. Yeah. He said, this guy he sprays cars, too. Yeah, I did. I, I That was my part-time job to, to make ends meet is uh, we did a mobile car wash. So you think about getting into that again? No, it was not. That wasn't a passion, <laughs> was it? No, <laughs> that was yeah. work. Yeah. So, but but the kids like Wes is a teacher, and I I don't know how much teachers make, but Andy's on school board, so and I know in house a good friend of mine. I know teachers are underpaid. All of them are underpaid. And I, I agree. And I don't think that I don't think that's ever going to change because we don't put a we don't we don't we don't make education a priority in our country like we should. And our kids are our backbone in our future, and we are failing them. So what's happening to me now is we're getting teachers that don't give a shit that are teaching because they can't find nothing else to do, and a lot of good teachers are finding other jobs that do pay better. I don't know. You there's don't so? there's so many teachers out there that have such a passion for what they do, and and they love kids, and they're in it for the right reasons. They're not always in it for the, the paycheck, but the things that they have to go through on a daily basis, they are not paid enough. No, no, I agree. But what about our science and our math teachers? Those people are going into other career fields because it does pay more. Yeah, I guess you're right. And that that hurts that hurts us. I mean, a good science teacher is probably you're a school board. Is that hard to find when Kent Deville retires? It's gonna be tough to replace him. Science and math are pretty tough. T- hard to find out here. Well, back in math back, probably 30, tougher. 40 years ago, it wasn't hard to find a good math teacher or science teacher. Now you can't find them because that guy is now a biologist working for a company an oil company doing something or whatever, and he's going to make good living. Yeah, that's probably and, true. And the politicians are preach are they're they're really going hard on. Uh, Check out them snazzy socks that Old Hutch is wearing down there. <laughs> he's like, he is a, <laughs> he is a like pimping out down here. School choice is got to look good, play good, the, yes. right. the good in the parking lot. <laughs> uh, school choice is going to become a major thing, and they're all. You know, it's, pushing it's, that. It's going to be interesting. What is the school choice? So if I my tax dollars, I have to pay. Tax dollars to school, and I ain't got a kid in school. I hadn't had one in a long time. But The money follows the kid. But what they're doing is some parents are going to figure, if this passes, parents are going to figure out that they can homeschool their kids, and they're going to get a check from. Oh, fuck. That's going to be the end of us. So uh, they, They're they going to have to have some type of uh, system to hold them accountable. Yeah, that's the thing is. is you can't just let them keep them at home you know there's got to, you know everybody else in the public school is held accountable with yes, test or be a star test or yeah, whatever so it is there's got to be an accountability uh no matter which and direction let me going. say what y'all are afraid to say because andy's on school board and you're just I'm a good person but i'm gonna tell you right now you're gonna have that bon bon twinkie fat ass chick that don't want to get her ass up out of bed that's got four kids by four different dads she gonna be getting seven thousand dollars a month to keep her kids at home and that's what's going to happen to our program. And then we're really going to be screwed up 15, 20 years uh, from now. I don't know if it'll come to that. Surely you don't not. think that it'll be the be? See, you're so, you've always, you're just too politically correct. No. You know damn well. They're not going to let that happen. If they I do, they though, will. if they get that check, that's there, what's going to happen. There's the uh, teacher pay scale 33 6 for your first year teacher. 10 month well, contract. even 20 years at $54,000, you go to work for McDonald's. Is that I'm not the state knocking. base that you have up there? Yeah, that's it. But From, McDonald's, if you've been at McDonald's 20 years, you're making more than $54,000 a year, I bet you. And you're done. Yeah. After, you're done at that. So so right when there. I first started coaching, I think our state base was 24. 24? 
So it's went so up it's nine up. in how how many years? Thirty one. That's not very good. No, actually thirty two. I coached for thirty two years. Thirty two years and it's went up eight thousand dollars. That's terrible. Yeah. That is that I mean that really that's that's not well, I can remember the coaches that coached me in high school would tell me they made six thousand a year. That, that was in probably early seventies. Jeez. But, and and that was a lot of money. Yes. Yeah. Because a house cost ten thousand right, dollars. Right. When you first started in thirty two years ago and you bought you a new pickup, I can remember paying twenty four thousand dollars for a brand new Z seventy one, nineteen ninety seven Z seventy one with all the bells and whistles. I paid twenty four thousand dollars. Which let's for be it. honest, it didn't have it had well, maybe it, it, had, it the, had maybe a CD player. It with had bells, the bells and whistles, and whistles back, back then. then, though. Yeah. It had power windows and power seats. <laughs> bells and so, whistles. So the first vehicle that I bought brand new, I had been coaching probably 12 years before I could afford a brand new pickup. Mm-hmm. And I think that's when I came to Knox City. <laughs> that's when we gave you that big baby bucks, <laughs> yeah. big money. And uh, I think I paid 28. Okay. That's okay. That's I was at 97. That was in two. 2002. Okay, I bought one in 97 and it was an extended a cab and a half, whatever. The third the third door Z71s right. and I paid $24,000 for it. And it, had, it was the best one you could get basically. Cuz yeah. nobody had the double cab pickups and everybody had the cab and a half. $24,000. That same pickup today, I don't know if they make a third one. $70,000. Oh yeah. It's crazy. I, yeah. will, I will probably not ever own another oh, new Jesus, vehicle. Oh here we go. I don't know if I will. I just can't make myself pull the trigger on something. On a hundred thousand dollar vehicle? I'm not doing it. Oh, that's I'll what, buy a used one, Jeff. That's way more. I, I could. Well, my wife has one. I don't. Like three, I have <laughs> three times my house. I'm not paying that no, for, for something. That's tornado chasing around. yesterday. The, the guy asked yeah. me about that. He goes, "You you 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 on your truck?" I said, "Yeah, it's got more dents and a fat girl's ass on it. It's, that's what it's chased for all the time. <laughs> that's right. You know, that's why I have it. I'm not going to buy me a new vehicle because it's going to look just like my old one." What do you think about the new NIL in colleges where they can just, the transfer portals open and they can come and go as they please? Yeah. I and the money. I'm not sure what I, I, I don't know what I think about the NIL. I just know from being a college player, and that's back in 1987, it was a job. Yeah. I mean, we had no free time. We had meetings all the time. It was basically a job. You were working your butt off. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this day and age, Companies are making a lot of money off of players' names. Yep. And that player's not getting nothing. Well, they are now. Yeah. But they weren't. So in a lot of ways, I think it's a good thing. In a lot of ways, um, it becomes a recruiting tool. Mm -hmm. So the richer schools are going to get the best players. So I think in the future, if you're not careful, whoever has the most money is going to have the best team. Well, you've got a son that played – Starting quarterback at Division Two school, right? They're, mm-hmm. I got in trouble by Duck Hodges because I said the wrong thing. Duck, division Three, Division Two, but Midwestern's Division Two, right? Yes. Okay, and he was starting quarterback there. Got absolutely zero dollars. Yeah, and he was, I believe, only on a half scholarship. So it cost his daddy some money for him to go to school. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Still paying. Okay. Some. I understand. I he's, wrote, pay, he's paying some too, though. <laughs> I wrote Texas Tech my last check about four years ago for Andy. Right. But it, it takes a while to pay that off. But 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 he wasn't getting anything out of it. My friend Jason Lavender that was on with us, his son signed us, left school early, graduated from Lovejoy, signed with SMU as a wide receiver. He gets three thousand dollars a month, I think, is what I saw. Yeah, they get, they actually 36. get paid now. He gets a check yeah. for three thousand dollars a month. I think all SMU football basketball players I think all so. see, and I like that part. Okay, they they should get something. Okay, because it's a job. But I agree. do you think they ought to mandate it where it's the same? If SMU's paying three thousand, Alabama should pay three thousand because we had yeah, a, I've, there's there needs to be a regulation. We, we had a kid on here, a guy that played linebacker at USC and played in the pros for three or four years, and I'd seen the same thing that he did. The Caleb Williams that was at OU went with Lincoln Riley to USC, twenty four million dollars a year supposedly what they're saying now. Anyways, from fifteen to twenty something million a year to play quarterback at USC. Wow. Why the fuck would you want to leave and go to the pros? <laughs> Because his first two, three years in yeah. the pros, he's not going to make $20 million a year. No. I think if you're the number one pick, you're this not. This still you're, says he only makes 2.6. No, he's making more than that. The kid at Tennessee's making $10 million. Okay. Look up and see what the salary is for the number one pick this year. For whoever gets it, because it's slotted. They've got a price. That kid at USC is making more money than James Washington's made in his career in one year. Yeah, that's incredible. To go play quarterback in college. There's a big price tag on quarterbacks. It's crazy. 
But you got to have one to win. The NFL mm-hmm. shows you that shit. Yeah, think about that golfer the other day, the amateur golfer from a And M. If he would have, t- could he, did Bennett? he have the option to take the check? I'm assuming he did. I don't know. Would you have? Well, if you, if if that was Hagen, if that was Hagen, and he was playing there, and he ended up, I think I saw where his check would have been half million dollars or something. I think it's two 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 hundred twenty four thousand. Is that I all think. it was? Yeah. Would you have told him to go back to a And M, or would you tell him to take two twenty four? Well, well, if there hadn't been a NIL, take the check. But he's going to make more off of NIL than I think he would have made in, in that tournament. Oh, they they said he looked like a NASCAR billboard. Mm-hmm. With Ping, he had a Ping hat on, didn't Ping, he? Ping, yeah. He doesn't look like a golfer. There's several that are sponsoring Ping. I think he got a, a contract with uh, maybe AT&T he, or one, he, of, one he of those ain't entities. struggling by any means. By any means, no, you know, doing, doing really, really good. So his he, and, he and made the, more and, off the NIL. And the, and the girl that was in the picture, she's, she's con- making. <laughs> she got a modeling contract. She didn't even have to play golf. She's making a ton of money. <laughs> who Tra- was she, who was from she one picture? With? Who was she with? I think with? she was there with her dad, Trevor Lawrence. His deal was thirty six, call it thirty seven, with a twenty four million dollars sign up. Okay, price. and that's a five year deal, right. four years with a fifth year option. So four years. He's making nine million dollars a year. The kid at SC, if he's making fifteen million a year, he's making more than Trevor Lawrence is making. Over if he stays for three years at SC, why leave? And take a pay he cut. Won't. He won't. Leave. Oh yeah, he's gonna be the first pick. He'll leave after this year, but I wouldn't. Yeah, but look at it this way: if you were that quarterback, you're getting zero dollars. But if you were to stay injury free and have a good career there and get drafted, I could make some money. But he's still one way. He's one play away from having a career-ending injury. Mm-hmm. But he, but he's making fifteen million a year. I know, but that's a good thing for him. But but, but what th- if he got injured and didn't get drafted? Well, he'd be worth zero. Ex- but but is it good for football? Uh, you're gonna have a lot of opinions on that. There's not a good. There's not. Everybody's got an opinion. That's all there is. But if I, the kid I think at, they should get paid. If the kid at SMU is making three thousand a month. And the quarterback mm-hmm. at SC is making fifty million. And let's be honest with you, SMU's got more money than USC. Yeah, got. there needs to be a regulation on that. It, it's got to be a. It, it, but how do you do it? I, I don't know. I told Andy I a long time ago, and Andy, of course, made fun of me for saying this. <clears throat> if Harvard wanted to get in the football college football game, they'd win national championship every year, be up there because their endowments worth about four hundred billion dollars right. or some shit. Right. They right. can afford what other teams couldn't. Some Could you imagine going to every five star high school recruit and saying, "Hey, I'll give you ten million a year to come here." We got plenty of money to yeah, do it. Yeah, you could buy you a team. And it wouldn't take but one year to switch it over. That's what's happening to college basketball. And it could happen. Yes. Because there's, uh, as far as I know, there's no regulation on that. If, no, if, I don't think that there is either. If Elon Musk was a regular person and went to a college, say he went to Vanderbilt, and he was a football fan, he could buy them a football team every yeah, year. Yeah, he could. You know? <laughs> Absolutely could. But I think that players should be compensated. because Jeff's argument is, well, they're getting an education. It's like, well... No, because like you said, most kids are on half scholarships. Like yeah, and, and I don't they, know how many like at Texas or Texas Tech. I don't know how many full rides they can give out, but it's not many. The third, street, I think it's twenty four in Division One, but I'm not don't, of what twenty four full rides. It's either twenty four or twenty five full rides a year per class. Yes, yes. There's there's ninety six of them. And if I you're D one D Division One, you have to put them on full ride. If you're Division Two, they can split those scholarships up. The third string. Center at the University of Texas and third string left guard at University of Texas right now is getting to go to school free at UT. No, he's not. Let me finish. This is go what he ahead. does. Just like Michelle. Michelle comes out and Andy all the time. Go ahead. Third year, the, the third string left guard is a four star, three star high school recruit. Is on a full ride, most likely. He's getting a free free education. Mm-hmm. He's getting all the cheerleaders he can go through in a year. Give me a break. He's having a great time in life, and. If he graduates from UT in four years and gets his fifth year, he's going to have his have his master's. He's got a head start in life because he played football at the University of Texas and opened every door for him. I don't feel sorry for him. Now, if Texas wants to pay all their players $5,000 a year across the board, every player, mm-hmm. I don't have a problem with that. I have a problem with you paying a kid – Ten million dollars here, and another kid ten million here. Texas has got more money tied up in right. Quinn years and Arch Manning, and one of them's not even going to play this year. And I'm telling you right now, in front of the world, Arch Manning's going to be a bust and will not finish oh, at Texas. Oh, here he goes. You watch. <laughs> you saw Arch- one little clip. Did you see him playing in the spring game? He was lighting it up. You saw uh, one clip. Who's starting? Quinn years. I just know there's a big difference going from high school football to college Amen. football, and it'll take you a year 
to get adjusted, and in the, my opinion. And the chances of him being an NFL quarterback are about less than 1%. I don't give a shit who the bloodline uh, is. I've never seen the kid throw or play, but evidently he's pretty good, or Texas wouldn't have. They've taken it. I Jeff, agree with you on Jeff that. Jeff and Tony saw one clip don't of him playing in here. high he's school. Not here to... No, uh, y'all do. Y'all do this all the time. You saw one clip of him playing in high school, and you're like, he didn't play, he didn't play against anybody. But it's, it's all horseshit. Now, <laughs> he just told you that 24 players are on full-ride scholarships. Per so, year. Or 25. Or per 20, year. We'll say 25. So if our five-year period, you've got 120 kids that are on full scholarships. That le- that third string left guard is not on a full ride. Bullshit. I hate to tell you. Look up Texas. I hate to tell Look you. up Texas's roster right now on their depth chart. Their third, I hate, I hate their to tell third you. string left guard is a three- or four-star recruit. He might be a sophomore. He might be a freshman. But that's their third-string recruit. Just like right now, if I wanted to go get a defensive lineman and draft in the NFL, I'd spend my last draft on the kid from Alabama, their defensive lineman that didn't get drafted. Because by God, he's a hoss and he might have been playing against a guy that's all American or yeah. played and he that's practiced true. every day. I'd take a chance on him. Mm-hmm. What do you got to lose? But they should be paid. I, th- Bottom I said line. I said they there need to be a uniform pay of it. Yeah, they just they're gonna have to regulate or it's gonna ruin the game on the big salaries. But as far as paying, like you said, a college player a stopping every month. I, I don't have. I agree with that. with that because they don't have time to get a part time no, job. I, right? I, I got they no have problem. no money right. unless their parents have money. But he shouldn't be getting twenty thousand a month or forty thousand a month. That that could be a problem. But but five plus another thing. Could you imagine a nineteen year old kid getting forty thousand dollars a month? Every one of them. Fuck. Uh, that's the parties I want to go to. Yeah. They wouldn't be worth shit. No. Fuck I think no. when the game starts to suffer, that's when they'll. Like right now, it's the Wild West. I know it's a big topic right now. It's going to be interesting to see how it all pans you out. You can't put the genie back in the bottle, as Andy says all the time. It's done. Oh, they're going to do. They're going to have to do something. They can regulate. Something. And you know who it bit. You know who it hurts the most? Nick Saban. Oh yeah, he's not happy about because it. no because he had all. he had a tool to all five star kids. Want to go to Alabama? You go get in the NFL. Yeah. Now it's well shit. I can go to Tennessee. Kind of more money. Kind of even the playing grounds a little big bit. Big time. It didn't happen much in college this year because the big the big schools were well TCU was there, but it wasn't because of uh, the NIL deal. They just had a really good team. But mm-hmm. it's Michigan, Georgia, Ohio State, and TCU. Well, there none of them were bought by the NIL. But it's going to be long. We're going to have Louisiana Tech and somebody else that can pay for a bunch of players for a couple of years. One of them schools is going to end up busting into the party. Nick Saban does not seem like Mr. Personality. I don't know how he swings the recruits because he wins. I understand that. But I don't understand, like, when he was a nobody and he started getting these big recruits. Like, I don't understand. When was he, he a nobody? Because he's not. When he was first starting, you think everybody, oh, there's Nick Saban. Like, I, I want to go play for Nick Saban. He play, He coached at Cleveland. He was a head coach. And they fired yeah. him. And Bill Belichick was his they defensive were on the same, coordinator. Yeah, they were the same style. No, I think that's backwards. Belichick was head coach and I Saban think, was his defensive so. coordinator. And then he got a job at, out, at LSU and he won. Once you win, those schools have great recruits. I mean, let's be honest. If you well, go, if you coached at Mississippi, Ole he, Miss, he just doesn't seem. They like, have great talent, no matter who's there. Right. I mean, they, they, those Here, guys. here's the deal about Saban. If you if you've ever heard him speak, well, I've heard him speak several times at coaching clinics, and he is he is unbelievable as a as a speaker. I can tell he's unbelievable as a motivator. Mm-hmm. You can tell he's probably one of the most organized coaches out in the profession. He's class act. He's straightforward, tells you like it is. So I'm assuming he's a very honest man. So when you get a guy like that mm-hmm. in front of a family or a recruit, I'm pretty sure he can sway them. He one can. Way. Yeah. Right. And he's got, he's and, going up. Look at what he's got to offer you. And right. you can't You're deny. Play for a national championship. Yeah, you can't deny his record. Yeah. I mean, he's pretty much won everywhere he's been. They said Barry Switzer used to tell kids all the time, said, we'd love to have you at Oklahoma. And if you come to Oklahoma, we're going to play for a national championship. And if you go to Nebraska, we're still going to be playing for a national championship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, I wonder how a coach – remember Bum Phillips? Used to coach the Houston Oilers yes. a long time ago. Had the Cowboy hat. I mm-hmm. wonder how a guy like that would do as a coach today. Because I think that he old, was – That old school's phased out, I think. Well, I don't know that he was an old school like uh, Lou Holtz where he'd chew in your ass and get in your ass as much as he was just a good old boy that the I players he, liked. Yeah, I think he was a player's coach. Kind of like Dan Campbell is at Detroit. He, the players so. liked him. But I, I wonder how some – okay, some of the old-time coaches like a George Hallis or Vince Lombardi. 
Vince Lombardi, one of the greatest coaches ever. I think he would do great. And here's an example. One, uh, I had an offensive line coach at, at Lubbock Monterey, and I inherited him. And he was one of the best offensive line coaches I've ever coached with. His name's Bob Stanley, but he he had been coaching for 40 years, and he's still coaching. He's still coaching in Albuquerque. He loves kids. He loves the game. I mean, it's unbelievable that he can do what he can do. But speaking of old school, now that's an example of a coach you would think is old school, and how well is he going to do with kids of this Right. Day and age, well, they absolutely would run through a wall for him. I mean, they absolutely loved him, and I don't think he changed his coaching style. From did he chew on their asses? Oh yeah, up? oh yeah, that's I mean, good. Uh, but what they knew is uh, what they did know is that he cared about them and he loved them, and they would. It didn't matter if he chewed their tail, and they respected him, and they would play for him. See, the- and so when you talk about Bum Phillips, you know, same way. You're you're gonna like the guy. He's a players coach, but they're they're also gonna respect him. So if you can, you know, if you can get a kid to respect you and play hard for you, you know, you can be old school, non old school. You know, Joe Paterno, his last couple of years he won, and then the sex deal kind of was the end right, of that deal. Right. But he was still winning football games up until a couple of years before that, pretty good. I mean, oh, he yeah. didn't forget how to coach. No. And he could recruit with the best because the kids liked him. Right. And um. I think Bill Belichick's getting a bad rap now because they're not winning now. Well, Tom Brady went there. Well, Tom Brady didn't do shit his last two years in Tampa Bay when it came to winning a Super Bowl. He won one Super Bowl. But those last two years, they got this beat. The Dow Cowboys beat the shit out of him. And the year before, they got beat. What? Look at his record the last two years he coached. Tom Brady didn't win a Super Bowl his last two years. In New England. Is no, what you're no, in Tampa Bay. But they won they, a Super Bowl. They, he, he did win a Super Bowl. That That's right. He did do that. I'm not saying that he didn't win without Belichick, but I think Belichick's getting a bad rap. Well, it was all Tom Brady. I don't think it was all Tom Brady. No. I think it was a, it was no. a, the, the, them together were both very good. <laughs> very, very good. But, but, but Brady Belichick, has proven that he's better without Belichick than Belichick is without Brady. Brady had a better roster the year he won a Super Bowl than Belichick did. Belichick had lost his roster. That. But Belichick is a great coach. He needs to retire. His time is done. But you give him a talent again, he's going to win again. He, he will. will. Does he need to retire? I don't think I he I don't does. think he needs to retire. I like I, him. He's one of my favorite coaches, and he, he holds his – Players accountable, when, and that's why the, some of the flashy guys don't like him, right? But but, but if they don't like, him, he'll get rid of him, yeah, no, because shit. he's more into the team concept yep. than you know a, a star player, and that's why he wins Super Bowls. Because when it comes down to 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 the nut cutting time at the end of the Super Bowl and winning the game, his team's going to win because they're disciplined. If mm-hmm. if you look at the statistics on him on Tom Brady too, Tom Brady had. Two things going for him in his life. His first one, he played for Coach Belichick. And I'm not taking nothing away. Tom Brady's probably the greatest quarterback that ever played. Is the greatest, period. I, I don't Done. know. Yeah, he, he's the GOAT. He, Who are you going to put up there with him? Right now, nobody. With a Patrick face. Mahomes might now, be in there in Patrick, a couple of years. Patrick Mahomes plays another decade. Yes. Yeah. But Tom Brady, there's no – it's it's Tom Brady's like Michael Jordan. There's no there's no second. But Tom Brady also was very was a benefactor of playing with teams with great defenses. When Tampa Bay won their Super Bowl a couple of years ago, they also had a great defense. Yes. And and he left and went to a perfect place. Well, Belichick, you look at the Belichick took points off the other team's board. He was a great coach. You give him two weeks to figure out a game plan on somebody, he's gonna beat your ass. He'll get after you. Very good coach. Did but you, but all good teams, if there's one thing in common of all good teams, like you said, there's they have a good defense. Yes. Or they got an above average defense. Mm-hmm. But the the one factor that separates teams is the quarterback. Yep. And I've said it my entire career. If you do not have a good quarterback, your offense is not going to be very good. That's just my opinion. The Baltimore Ravens. Now you have to have once. a great you have to have a very good supporting cast but you can have a great supporting cast and a guy taking the snap every time and he's not very good that offense ain't gonna be very good no you might you the the carolina panthers got beat by denver because of von miller where they win the super bowl what 12 to 9 that year or something yeah. and tampa and uh well, baltimore there's, outli- there's outliers to everything baltimore won the super bowl one year when they because of their defense but usually you have to be good on the offensive side and you have to have a good quarterback this, this day and age you got score points yeah there's, now NFL not as much because they're they're so talented on defense they're so fast but in like college and high school you got to score points. I'm gonna ask you a tough question now and Lamar Jackson 
I think Lamar Jackson has put himself in a box, and I think Lamar Jackson has fucked himself big time. And I think this Jalen Hurts contract hurt him because Jalen Hurts' guaranteed money was not near what Lamar Jackson thinks he's worth, and Lamar Jalen Hurts just come back injury-free, went to a Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. Lamar Jackson hasn't won but one playoff game. He was an MVP in 2018. That was a long time ago. Right. Has been hurt the last two years. Do you think he's asking for too much money? And do you, I, I think he's. I think his the reality of what he's going to get is not nowhere close to what he thinks. I he's think worth. his play yeah. style. I think they're all paid too much money, but that's just the nature of the game now. Well, are but, they paid too much? Or if you went by the percentage of what a, va- a franchise is worth, what the quarterback is, they're getting paid less than Roger Staubach was making. Really, I didn't realize that. Well, yeah. Well, but, if you look at the percentage, yeah, yeah. the ca- ca- yeah. Redskins are going to sell for seven billion dollars, basically. Wow. I mean, if if. The Cowboys, when they won the Super Bowl the last time, they were probably worth fifty million dollars. Hundred? Well, no, no. Before Jerry Jones, when 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 Rogers when when Jerry Jones bought the Cowboys, I think he paid a hundred million dollars for them or something. And now the Cowboys are probably worth ten billion dollars. Right. So Dak's making forty million dollars. That's not a right. compared to what Troy Aikman was making. That's not sure. The percentages are different there, but I think <laughs> Lamar Jackson is 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 has screwed himself. He just he just he's. The way he plays the game, he's put him. He puts himself out there to be that one play away from a career-ending injury. I mean, I just don't like the running quarterback. I would not if I was an owner. And it's tough in the NFL. And he had that style of play. I'm not cutting you a big check. The the funniest person for five years of all the people and all the social media that's pushing for him to make this money is RG three. Well, RG three is the reason nobody wants to pay a bunch of money because he was great till he got his legs blown out right, from under him. Right. Kyler Murray, another example of wasted money. That's the worst contract. That's one of the worst contracts in football. You know, how do you pay a guy forty million dollars and he's got ACL and gonna miss a whole year? Uh, that's, that's tough. RG three, that was a gruesome injury. Like he shouldn't have even been out but there. But when though. but when he's healthy, they're really good. Yeah, they, they are. <laughs> Makes a difference. But yeah. you know, them guys don't win Super Bowls. Right. The good old fashioned. I was, back. Glad, I was glad to see Jalen Hurt, Hurts get that contract from everything he had been through in college. You know, hell of a character. Ah. Uh, Absolutely. Unbelievable the character he had at Saban Alabama. Kind of dicked him over. Yeah, when he got benched yeah. and the way he responded, what a class act. And then he goes to Oklahoma and has a great career. And then, and then the Super Bowl, unbelievable. This is what kills uh Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson. If they'll show it. You just see it like it was already torn, right? Like yeah. oh well, gosh. right there. Oh, I hate watching that. Yeah. Have you uh <clears throat> I'm sure you have Oof, I can't watch it. <clears throat> high school kids. Like what is the what is uh, obviously they don't have trainers and stuff like this at the high school level. I'm sure it's still pretty good, but if you tear your ACL in high school, I mean, are they able to put them back together to come play again like next year? Like if they do it their junior year. Yeah, I think it's a I think now it's an 8 8 to 10 month Mm-hmm. Rehab, even at the high school level. Yes, so they are advancing even for that. So like yes. you don't have to be pros or anything like no, that. Like they've got good trainers and good medical staff. Yes, yeah, we had a great training staff at at Monterey and a good supporting cast with our orthopedic surgeons. Were you seeing the increase in soft tissue injuries your final couple of years coaching? Because they say they say it's more indicative of like baseball players just because of that travel ball, like the elbows are given right, out on young right. kids a lot more. But <laughs> honestly, I didn't see it. No, and I think that's uh, has a lot to do. So at Monterey, we we got to hire a strength and conditioning coach, mm-hmm. and that's the first time in my career I'd I'd ever turned over like an off season to somebody else. But they're professionals, and they've they know how to do some things to get athletes better than what, you know, us as coaches grew up right. learning. And so turning it over to him and some of the things that he would do as far as lifting and not overlifting and things like that, um, I saw in a, a decrease in injury. Just because they were making stronger ligaments and tendons yes. through these off-season and, and, programs? And movements. They, oh, right. You know, with agility. Yeah. Some of the agility movements, the way we lifted – um, would strengthen some of those muscles that surround the joints right. and ligaments that when you made that hard cut, they were already used to it because of some of the agility that they'd put us through. So I didn't see that many injuries. 
They say turf is also there's a big push right now to get turf out of the NFL. Hmm. No, I hadn't. Just because of the even I the new remember. turf. Yeah, like they, they want to go totally to grass. I thought hey, that was because of concussions though, morning. I thing. think the old turf was really bad. I yeah. remember playing yeah, on it. Concrete that. Memorial Stadium. I never got there. I played in the I played in the stadium at Sam Houston when I was at Angelo, and I never I never got hit on my knees or you know took a blow to my knees. But after that game, the next day my knees were so sore uh-huh. I couldn't hardly touch them, and it was because of the turf. But turf's come. Um, you know, it's come a long, long I, way. The I, turf we have today is... It's got that rubber shit in it. Yeah, it's 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 nice. And, and at Lubbock, we put a turf field in that took out a certain percentage of the heat. You know, the old, old mm-hmm. turf would be at like 125 in a hot day. And the stuff they put in our turf there would reduce that like 30 to 40% they, and, uh, and make it bearable to practice on. They... Uh, I thought the big push on the AstroTurf was the concussions from the concrete floors for the guys hitting their heads. Right. And that was another thing. When we had uh, Cam Smith on, he played for USC, and then he played for the Vikings. He said the way the reason we're seeing an increase in concussions is because of the way that defenders have to tackle the quarterback now. So now you can't land with your body weight on the quarterback because it's roughing the passer. Mm-hmm. So the way that they're teaching these guys to tackle the quarterback is to grab them and then basically slingshot them and roll over with them. And what that's doing is you get the quarterback and then you slingshot him to the ground while you're just whiplashing his head off of the right. off of the turf. So you're saving shoulders for heads basically. And it's all it's all on the uh changes in what is roughing the passer now. Hmm. Yeah, I really hadn't paid a whole lot of attention to that. Now we had we definitely have, you know, they've taken the head out of tackling now. And we have specific drills that we would put our kids through to teach them to take the head out of tackling. And then, you know, we would would tackle, wrap, and then we would teach our kids to roll. And mm-hmm. then the first year they came out, and then the second year, you know, they kind of took the roll out of it. Could could have been related to what you're talking about. I don't know. To but, the head? You know, back in the day, we'd tell you you'd put your Rydell on them, you know. Yeah, you can't say that no more. You're gonna get a lawsuit. <laughs> but, but put your put your Idell right on, you know, yeah. right on the outside number. Go, go hit him with your head. Well, you don't teach it like that anymore. Do you think it's because the kids are getting? Well, I know why we don't do that because of head injuries. Yes, but you we've think come a, we've come a million miles on teaching how to tackle properly, taking your head out. But do you think a lot of that has – the injuries and stuff, kids are just bigger and faster now than they used to be. I, yeah. I mean, like when you – you were a, a stud athlete. How would you run the forty in when you were a senior? Uh, four five eight, I think. It that, was. that was fast. Or four six. How many, I think I ran four five three in college. And that, that, and that's fast. High school four six. But in high school nowadays, if you see a four four kid, that's not unusual, is it? No, no, they've gotten a lot faster. That's what I'm saying. Faster. And a lot of that's and related to getting trained right in the in the weight room. The the you know the agility drills that we do nowadays. And when you were play, when you were coaching Lubbock, you had some grown ass men playing linebackers that you played against in six A and five A football. Didn't oh you? yes, I mean six foot three, two hundred and thirty pound kids. A few that could run. Yes, you know, could you imagine that guy playing football in nineteen eighty three? Oh, he'd dominate. That, yeah. that, that just, but that, but that's, but every team's got one now. Just about one Aaron Donald yes. runs the forty and four six. Aaron Donald. And how big is he? Three hundred pounds. Six yeah. three two eighty five. I bet. Yeah, somewhere around that. Yeah, so when four you, six on that frame, on that that's incredible. What, what, what's that tight end that played for Georgia this year? Six foot seven, two hundred and eighty five pounds. I think he's a four five guy. Mm-hmm. How's he booked tight end and not a tailback somewhere? That's what's crazy to be that fast. <laughs> yeah, he must not be. A, he must not have any lateral movement. I'm telling you, they just <laughs> he's six gotta one, have a little little lateral movement. Six to be one two eighty five. Six one two eighty five and runs a four six forty. I mean that's just a freak, and then you got that guy falling on top of you. And someone moved him, moved him to defensive tackle, and they're like, mean. "What are you doing? Putting him at defensive? That boy should be playing tailback." Yeah, I'd, I'd have him at defensive end. I always like those yeah. tall defensive ends that can run. Miles Garrett is another one. Like he's just a specimen. He's a six foot five guy. I think. Did you see him in high school compared to like the kids he was playing? He runs a four four. What's he six five two eighty? Uh, let me see. He is 6'4", 272. And runs a 4'4", Runs a 4'4", But that's what I mean. They're just bigger. There wasn't guys like that. Lawrence Taylor, look and see what Lawrence Taylor's is. Lawrence Taylor was a freak 
because of how big and fast he was at the mm-hmm. time. If he played today, he would still be a great ball player. He's a great, but he would not be no different than Miles Garrett. Right, six three two forty. See, he was he was he was didn't wasn't weigh as much. What did he run the forty in? Four or five. Yeah, but that but wow. it, there was nobody like him. But he though. was the first guy to do that. Yeah, yes. run, run a four or five and be that big, but also be mean. Yes. Yeah, injuries are going to happen. I listened to a podcast <laughs> about him though. You got to be a little mean. That guy, he had a lot of dog in him. Mm-hmm. I mean, he ate cocaine for breakfast. I think he had a lot of other stuff in him too, besides just some dog. Yeah, but. Just a crazy, crazy. But the, you got to be crazy to be a linebacker. But when he they talked about him and the, the the Lawrence Taylor wasn't bad. It was the LT, this psycho ego he had of himself. He's just a fucked up dude. Look at Miles Garrett in high school. Like, what are you gonna do to stop that guy? There's nothing you can do. Look at that that redheaded kid. That's his only claim to fame is that he got his picture taken with Miles Garrett. <laughs> Miles Garrett's got a shirt on. The rest of the D line men are. <laughs> I'm gonna keep my shirt on for this. You, you let that guy get off the bus first <laughs> <laughs> in Take front in off. front of the opponent's dressing room, and yeah. you're already six points ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, what are you gonna do? Like, We're, there's nothing. There's nothing you're gonna do. Put to on his high school. Guy. Where do you go to school at? I know it's in Texas. No, down on the right, bottom right, or bottom left. I'm sorry, on that other right, right in the middle, right there. Miles Garrett, Solomon Thomas, Dallas Morning News. The oh, next picture over. Yeah, where do you go to school at? Uh, oh, Arlington uh, Martin. Yeah, that's what that says. Yeah, yeah, he's got a Martin shirt on right there, so I'm assuming that's what it is. But I mean, come on. And then like, what the crazy thing is is he goes to a college, and then I don't know what he weighed in high school, obviously, but I guarantee you they added twenty, thirty pounds of muscle on him when he got to college. Oh yeah, but yeah, I mean, he's it's a just, specimen. The stars have to align because if he's not a hard worker in the weight room and everywhere else. He's just a big kid that had a lot of potential in high school. Did right. you ever see the kid at Monday play ball, the big kid? I can't remember his name now. The Dawkins guy. The one that got in trouble. He was going to Florida State. Mm, I'm not sure if I did. Yeah, have you seen him? Like, he looks like a fucking door. He looks like Debo. Six foot, I'm saving three or four, 280 pounds. And I mean, he was a, ma- a man child right. at Monday. I mean, if Bobby Bowden's recruiting you at Monday, Texas, go to Florida State back in the heyday, you, and he got in all that trouble and he didn't go. But I can't imagine a kid that big playing Class A football at that time. He'd he dominate. Yeah. Will Flemings, the Texas Tech football basketball player, he played at Paducah, and I think he was an all-state defensive tackle. Yeah. But he had to be about six, 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 seven at the time. Yeah, he's a big man. He probably should have played college football. I mean, he was a hell of a college basketball yeah. player. I mean, he was playing at Southwest Conference yeah, player he, of the year. But. He, he's definitely agile to be able to play basketball. So you're, he, he would have been a heck of a football player. Your D linemen in today's football have six have a six-pack. Like, that's not, it's not Tony Saragusa anymore. Yeah. Don't make fun of Goose. He's dead. Well, or, or RIP. But, yeah, I mean. It's, a, it's amazing how far we've come with, with strength and conditioning. I well, don't know what the end game is all the, Even the offensive linemen are not fat boys no more, hardly. No, Most of them are big. Yeah, you can't. This day and age, you can't be if you can't if you can't move a little bit, have a little bit of speed. You can't play the game. Before we get off here, because we've spent about two hours, I know you're a busy over man. You got a lot of stuff to do yeah. today. Um, if you did your life all over again, would you change much? I wouldn't change a thing. That's good. That's good to hear. I have no regrets. What was harder to leave was was uh, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Here. What about three more kids? We had three more boys. <laughs> yeah, that would have been nice. <laughs> Someone would still be they, they'd be throwing so much money at you for three more. If, if I hadn't been coaching, I might have had a few more. <laughs> I couldn't afford them. <laughs> Here's your hard question: What was uh, harder to leave, Knox City or Stanford, when the time came? Stanford, because yeah. Knox City was going six man. Well, well that's uh, true too. You know, Knox that. City, Knox City uh, is is my roots. Right, that's my home. And to come back here and coach and teach in the same halls that I was a student. Mm-hmm. That was a special time in my career to be able to come back and do that. And then we had success here and that, that was cool. And I probably would have stayed in Knox city. Had we not been, down. been dropping numbers because I could have stayed, uh, I would have been happy in Knox city. I, I mean, that's home. I could have done that. But I didn't want to change my career mm-hmm. and Stanford wasn't very far away from home. So that's the reason I went to Stanford. So I think, you know, they're equal. It was hard to leave Knox City, even though we were going to six-man. I even 
remember getting some notepads out and talking to Coach Underwood about some six-man stuff <laughs> and trying to figure out how to do six-man football. But I was so far in my career at that particular time, I didn't want to start over. Right. And so it was hard to leave. I don't know which one was harder. Um, having all the success we had at Stanford, we had been – we I think we were at Knox City for seven years. Mm, probably so. And about seven to eight years at Stanford. Mm-hmm. And when you stay in a community that long and invested that much time and energy, they're equally hard to leave. Well, and I mean, it wasn't like Stanford was 0-10 the year you left. Like, they were not yeah, they were dominant. Uh, we any. beat their lips off two years in a row. Here. Yeah. When I took that <clears throat> job, they were 1-30. 1-30? Over three years, man. One in 29. Or 29, yeah. So when you're looking for a new job, do you look at the junior high and you're like, mm, I, I could maybe do a program here? Or are you just like, Stanford is where we're going? Well, it was interesting on Stanford because, you know, we played in a little little league mm-hmm. baseball um, and they were in our league. And I remember going to Stanford and I'm sitting in the outfield and I think we were playing Stanford. And they had a bunch of kids that looked like they were really fast running the bases and they were pretty athletic. And I told my wife, I said, if that thing ever comes back open, I, I'm going to try to apply for this job because I think there is some potential here right? just by watching them play baseball. And that next year they had just hired a staff and I thought, well, they'll never come back open. And so I stayed in Knox city. It came open the next year. We were going six man and I knew what I saw at that baseball game. I was <laughs> like, that's something we can build on. Right. And there were one in 30 or one 29. And I love those type of jobs Yeah, because you can't go anywhere but up. Yeah, (laughs) You want two two games in three years. We're keeping you. (laughs) So anything that you go in there and do is an improvement. (laughs) And then if you improve it like we did uh, and, and be fortunate enough to, to win as many games as we win, that always is a stepping stone to something bigger. And so, yeah, that's, that's how I ended up at Stanford. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. I tell you what, and I, sh- I think only two people applied for that job. I can imagine so. You're one in thirty. <laughs> two people applied. Nobody's dumb enough to, to apply for that. The other, the other guy, they hired the right guy. I hated when you left here, but I'm glad you did because it's been the best thing happened to you. It was good for mm-hmm. for you know you, you always got to do what's best for your family and a lot of in a lot of, well in pretty much in every instance and that was the best move for my family oh, you did, at the time. you did a great move for your family. It was a big loss for <clears throat> Knox City because we lost you, we lost the Macklemores, we lost the West. Now, if you would have stayed in Knox City and we played six man with your weight program you had going on, we would have won some state championships in six man. I really believe that with those kids that we lost too. Right. I, mean, I don't know. Different. I do. I know that in my heart. I do. You, Just because we lost the, those kids, because the kids that we lost because you left that ended up leaving, Kenyon Thompson would have stayed here. We don't want state championship because yeah, Kenyon he Thompson. Was a, he was a stud. He was, sure. but it was a bit. But it was good for your family, and I'm glad that it's worked out the way it is. And you got a great family. They meant a lot to my kids and my family growing up. And you was always good to our kids. And the biggest loss for y'all even was pain because all his friends left. And I wish right. for his sake we would have moved to Stanford. And we come awful close. You don't know how close we came to moving to Stanford. Oh, I remember. Real, real, real close. I remember. Real close. But see, it worked out for you, too. I don't Everything know how that happened out. out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't no. know how that changed. <laughs> I'd still we, be doing business the same. But yeah. I, we, and I was glad Coach Steele came here because I love him like a brother, right. too. And he was a lot of fun. And we had a lot of good times. And he was a good guy. But I've always believed that things happen for a reason. And everywhere that I've been we fell in love with every place we've ever been. And it's like, a, it goes back to wherever you go. It's what you make it. Yeah. And it, you know, been, we've been very blessed as a family. We have a lot of great friends. We hated to leave Knox city, but we weren't very far and I'm still not very far. And, well, I've and noticed we, you've and, come out and had lunch with us a bunch in the last yeah. five years. <laughs> and, and we, we've had a lot, we've met a lot of good friends at every place we've ever been. And you know where been, I'm jealous we've been of you, blessed. where you live that I wish I'd live? Where's that? Lubbock. Lubbock's a great place. I could live in Lubbock. I really could. We if love me and Lubbock. Michelle retire, if we could retire ever, or I actually we could go somewhere else, I would my grandkids. But now my grandkids, I want I want to be by them all the time. Mm-hmm. But I, I could see any <clears throat> love. You loved Lubbock, didn't you? I do. That'd be L- a good Lubbock's place. A great, yeah, it's a great place. It's a small enough place, but it's big. It has yeah. everything you need. But I'm telling you, that place is growing so fast. Yeah. It's the fastest growing place around, in my opinion. We I got a it's unbelievable. We I got a barbershop there now. Jerry's Barbershop. 
Really? I love that place. I'll be going back in a couple <clears throat> weeks to get a haircut yeah. there. We went a couple yeah. weeks ago to watch a Texas Tech baseball game. And like when I was there in college, it stopped at 98th. And now, like it's 114. Like it's way the heck out. Yes. I think the new HEB is like they're, they're building or something. Half a million to a million and a half dollar homes out towards uh, that small town new home. Whew, You're fixing to see new home blow up. That'd be a big place. I tell you what, Michelle loves the freaking United there. I don't know what oh, it is. Yeah. The, the, you go to the Market Street. Oh. H-E-B. No, United. H-E-B is the way to go. United. And yeah. I'm telling Newest you, what, if, you're a, Texas. if you're a single man, you don't need to go to a bar. You need to go to the United on the good side of town and love I it. know exactly what you're that, talking that's, about. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. That's the place to go find you a woman or <laughs> yeah. wife because there's a lot of future wives walking around that place yeah. wearing yoga pants. <laughs> And the people that they make yoga pants for, not the ones that are too mm-hmm. too big. <laughs> Did you ever want to try to go co- coach college at all, or high school is where you wanted to stay? I really never gave it much thought for college. Really, I was always happy in the high school level. Yeah, how's the golf game these days? Well, if I didn't if I didn't have the chip yips, I'd be pretty good. The chip so yips you still playing as good as you used to then? Uh sometimes. Can you beat Mitch? I, I got I got the driver in the fairway. I hit my irons really good and I putt good. But if I get around the green, if I miss the green, I'm probably going to blade it or chili dip it right now. But if, as long as I hit the green, I can shoot 75 or less. If I don't hit the green, it turns into an 81. So you're still in your head on your chipping. Yes. <laughs> can you beat Mitch right now? Right now, probably just because he hasn't played in probably two years. But before. Back when he was in his prime, he was really hard to beat. He's the most competitive person I know in my life. Oh, yeah. We went out on a fishing trip the other day, and he put it on me in, in crappie fishing. Of course, it you know, it's really not a competition until you get out there on the lake, and then it's like, how many did you catch? Well, I caught <laughs> so-and-so. Well, I only caught so-and-so. Yeah, he's a, he's a competitive. <laughs> but he put it on me the other day. We went to uh, went out to Breckenridge. Well, I, yeah, we went to Breckenridge, like Daniel and um, – he got on a roll there and put it on me pretty good, but we caught some good fish. He's Mitch is a neat dude. I've never seen a person go play golf. It's supposed to be relaxing that drinks four Red Bulls, <laughs> smokes two packs of cigarettes, and has six coffees and three Cokes to yeah. relax. Yeah, he's highly competitive. He's just like all of us. He's like I said, team. we're like a brother. How bro- did you know we're like have brothers. a vice? A what? A vice. Because Coach Mack, like, he's he's smoking and dipping in Red Bull, and, like, you're just over there just cool as a cucumber. All-American boy. Where did your stress go to? Like, you had to have something. Looking good in the parking lot. Uh, playing golf and fishing was probably – no, I grew up. My Both my parents smoked, and my dad drank a little bit, and I watched that growing up, and I was like – and my clothes always smelled like smoke. And I was right. like, you used to make me so mad. And so I just – you know, that just kind of turned me off to to do that. Mm-hmm. I just stayed away from it. But coaching lifestyle, it's hard. It's stressful. And like, you just never really gave in to any like deep temptation or anything like that. Like, you know, I don't know how you did it. Well, I have a lot of faith in God. And honestly, as a head coach, if you don't have that, man, it can wear you totally out. Yeah. But that, that's. Well, you like to gamble. Oh, I do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in Vegas I'm one not going to lie. I like, <laughs> if, if I go to the golf course, we're going to play for $2. We, 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 were in, <laughs> we were in Vegas. and $2 <laughs> a stroke or what? We're playing blackjack. $2 a hole? And Wayne, Wayne had like a 12, and he told that guy, he said, hit me. And that guy gave him a face card. He, Wayne, hey, you knocked the shit out of that one. <laughs> 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 do you remember the chili that night? No, I don't. We went to, we went, me and, it was me and you went on our own. Everybody else did their shit. Oh, they we went somewhere. Okay. And, um, I'm glad you got a good memory. I got a great. I can remember so much. I can't shit. remember nothing. And we anyway. stopped. We, we was going to get a hot dog. Everybody else was going to eat somewhere fancy. Me and you went on our own. And I and I I got a hot dog. So I'm getting a hot dog. You said, "Oh, I'm going to get a chili dog." And I go, "I wouldn't do that if I was you." I go, "Why?" <laughs> I said, "That's a 24 hour pot of chili." I said, "That fucker might be six years old." I said, "I wouldn't do chili. You do what you want." Fucking, you had to have chili dog. You come down at breakfast that morning. And you go, "I wish I'd listened to you about that chili." <laughs> so I told you. And that's it. Me and Michelle talk about that all the time. If we go somewhere and they got chili, she loves chili dogs. Yeah. Like, Listen, if that fucker's open 24 hours a day, yeah, don't, don't do it. Don't touch chili. That's bad. Stay, stay away from the that's chili. That's funny. All right. It's been over two hours. We're going to let you go. It's been a pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. I all appreciate always. everything you've done for my family. Well, I, really I appreciate do. y'all too. It, it was awesome becoming friends with you guys living in Knox City, and we're still friends. So I appreciate it. Honored to be here.
Well, we're glad you'd be part of the now big I, podcast. Now I get to go uh, terrorize a couple eight-year-olds with my. Uh, you're gonna, we're going to do all the little things, right? What time is baseball tonight? That's Six. right. All right. Six. You just but. teach them all that quarterback stuff that you know, and you'll be <laughs> fine. Teach them how to be a leader. One thing that's amazing is you don't know how little they like kids today. I was always, if I could see it done, I could usually emulate it. There's a lot of kids that are not like that. Andy would have made a good coach. Like you show yeah. them how to do it, and it, they go back to the old way they've been doing it. And it's just like, oh, yeah. God. You learn, you learn to be a good coach teaching young kids. That's why I think every coach that comes out of college ought to have to go to junior high, right? To coach, to learn how to coach. Because if you can coach junior high guys, you can coach anybody. It's the way to go. All right. Yes. We're going to get out of the here. Greatest junior high coach in the history of sports was Colin Howard. Coach Howard. I yeah. think he was like 65 <laughs> and two over a seven year period or yeah. some shit. He's a good one, man. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. See ya. Ladies and gentlemen, go check out all of our sponsors. Check out Boss Shop Shells, Mossberg, Dive Bomb Industries, Pacific Calls, Gundog Outdoors, Shin Gear, Lucky Duck, Looking Glass Podcast, Half Outdoor Specialty, Stanfield Hunting Outfitters, Bangtail, Dirty Duck Coffee, Ducks Unlimited, Double T British Girls.